وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعْجَبٌ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أستاذ عبد الرحمن حسن وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته أخي جز... شهيد جزاك الله خير once again for joining me on the hot seat podcast uh, we've recently been talking about a lot of issues that are external to Islam but are affecting the Muslims mm-hmm. for example issues like the non-Muslim countries and how they deal with the Muslims we now want to talk about something a little bit closer to home an issue within Islam that is affecting the Muslims and that is the issue of the madhahib a lot of people when they first come into practice in Islam they hear about this madhhabs um, they might not fully understand it but it's something that they come across and this approach our approach towards these madhhabs and I'm intent- intentionally not defining it in English because I do want you to go into a little bit of what they mean in your introduction inshallah when they come across these things it confuses a lot of people they don't know what approach they should take to these kind of uh, madhhab and that is something that inshallah with the tawfiq of Allah, I want to try and unbox in today's episode of The Hot Seat. So again, I'm going to give you the introduction. You have a chance to set out your foundation, your principles. And if I could request just to briefly, and I know it's difficult, but briefly try and define what a madhab is. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, lahu alhamdul hasan wa thanaul jameel, wa shadu an la ilaha illallah wahadahu la sharika lah, yaqulu alhaqqa wa huwa yahdi sabil. وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Before I go into the definition of uh, التمذهب following a madhab I, there's a couple of points I want to talk about inshallah ta'ala and I think it's very important to understand the whole entire discussion properly Anything in the religion there's always two extremes there's either uh, extreme exaggeration and there's also sometimes extreme negligence and shaitan's goal is to throw the people into one of those extremes that's the aim and the objective of shaitan he just doesn't want the person to be in that middle path the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in surah al-fatiha oh Allah guide us to the straight path so in anything in the religion shaitan will always try his best to either make you exaggerate it or he will make you come with negligence. And وَلَا يُبَالِي بِأَيِّهِمَا ضَفِرٍ Shaitan doesn't care whichever of those two he fall, he throws you into. Allah says in the ayah, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُولَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِ ذَلِكُمْ وَصَاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Now this is my path. So there's a middle path, a straight path. So in everything in your life as a Muslim, don't ever allow yourself to go extreme in exaggeration and don't go extreme in negligence. Try to be balanced and be in the middle. And the balance isn't something you you feel it with your aql and your dhawq and you you know, this is, it feels good, I feel it. It's not. What is the middle path? Allah sanctions it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah tells us this is the middle path. So when we speak about the concept of tamadhub, we find a group of people who call to fanaticism. And he, they call to ta'asub, towards a imam or the one of the four imams they say you know i have to do task of this imam and etc which i'm going to speak about later inshallah another group of people they've opened this door of ijtihad so kullu amrin wa bakrin wa zaydin you know go to the quran and sunnah yourself do ijtihad and he, you're free to speak about anything related to the religion you're a free man go and the person hasn't reached that level so that is uh, a reality that we see There's that concept of Opening the door of ijtihad To those people not fit for it And there's that side of the coin Which is those people who call uh, Towards uh, fanaticism uh, To be fanatic Towards particular imams Blind follow him in everything he says Even if he goes against clear cut evidences No problem So inshallah ta'ala In this introduction Or this couple of points I want to mention it will lay down 
the foundation for our uh, discussion. Okay. The first thing I want us to understand is what is the role of our, of the messengers? What is the role of the scholars? And what is the role, I mean, what is the uh, thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does? Yeah, okay. what, what is Allah wa ta'ala's part? What is the messenger's part? And what is the Muslims? What is their role? And Imam al-Bukhari when he's sahih, he chapter a bab where he called it Babu Qawli Allahi Ta'ala Ya ayyuha al-Rasulu Balli ma unzila ilayka min rabbik Wa illam taf'al fama ballaghta risalatah Wallahu ya'asimuka min al-nas O Prophet of Messenger of Allah Convey that which has been sent down to you from your Lord And if you don't do it, you have not conveyed the message That's the chapter, he used an ayah from the Quran as the chapter in Bukhari And then he brought the statement of the Tabi'i uh, Muhammad uh, Ibn Shihab Az-Zuhri his statement, the teacher of Imam Malik. This now literally breaks down for us a very important message, which is the role of everybody. Mm. Imam Az-Zuhri said, Min Allahi risala. The message comes from Allah. The legislating comes from Allah. Wa ala Rasulillahi al-balagh. Wa ala Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-balagh. And upon the messenger is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to convey. The second. So Allah is the one who sanctions. Allah is the one who legislates. Upon the messenger is what to convey that message. وَعَلَيْنَ taslim, And anybody other than the messenger submits. This literally is the role of everybody. We have to understand who is the legislator? Mm -hmm. Allah. Okay. What is the Prophet's job, alayhi salatu wasalam? To convey. It is to what? To convey. The Prophet does not legislate from himself. He's conveying um, يعني, what Allah legislated. And upon us is to submit to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّبُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Allah says, Allah has bestowed His blessing upon the believers. When He sent out from them a messenger, this messenger, what, he do, what does he do? Yatlu alayhim ayati. He conveys the verse of Allah upon them. I mean, reads the Quran to them. Wa yuzakim, he purifies them. Wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wa al-hikmah. And he teaches them two things. The Quran and the sunnah. Hikmah here means the sunnah. So the messenger is conveying, he's teaching and he's educating the people the legislation Allah gave him. In what means did Allah give the Prophet the legislation? In what way? Through the Quran and the sunnah. فَسُنَّةُ النَّبِيُّ وَحْيٌ ثَانٍ عَلَيْهِمَا قَدْ أُطْلِقَ الْوَحْيَانِ the sunnah is a revelation from Allah. And the ayah says that everybody was upon misguidance before Muhammad came with what? The Quran and the sunnah. Also Allah wa ta'ala, he says, Allah has taught you the kitab and he taught you the sunnah. He taught you that which you did not know. And the virtue of your Lord upon you is great Muhammad. Allah is talking to the Prophet. Allah taught you, Muhammad, that which you did not know. By teaching the Quran and the Sunnah, and the virtue of your Lord upon you is great. Also, Allah wa Taala He says, "What fi min wal Allah kana latifan khabira. Read, I'm a remember that which has I'm a mentioned that which was recited in your houses, the Prophet's houses. What was recited in it? Min ayatillahi, the verses of Allah, wal hikmah and wisdom. And the wisdom here is what the Sunnah. Those verses give us the understanding that the virtue and the job of the Prophet mainly mm -hmm. that we take from it was that he was conveying on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ways that he was conveying is through the Quran and the Sunnah. ولذلك, Allah wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, فَهَلْ عَلَى الرُّسُلِ إِلَّا الْبَلَاءُ الْمُبِينَ This is the job of the messengers to convey and to give the message that was given to them. Allah also said, قُلْ أَطِعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِعُوا الرَّسُولَ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْهِ مَا حُمِّلَ وَعَلَيْكُمْ مَا حُمِلْتُمْ وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا مَا عَلَى الرَّسُولِ إِلَّا الْبَلَاءُ الْمُبِينُ Allah says, قُلْ أَطِعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِعُوا الرَّسُولَ Obey Allah and His Messenger. If He turn around, فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْهِ مَا حُمِلَ upon you is that which you've taken upon yourself. وَعَلَيْكُمْ مَا حُمِلْتُمْ and upon them is what they've taken. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ if you obey him, تَهْتَدُوا you're guided. وَمَا عَلَى الرَّسُولِ إِلَّا الْبَلَاءُ الْمُبِينُ إذن محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم nothing is upon him to convey, except to convey. Did the messenger convey this message to us? Yeah, he did. The evidence for that is the hadith narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ on the day of Hajj, 
when he was given the final sermon, Hajjatul Wada'a, the Prophet stood up amongst the people and he said to the people, Allahumma hal ballakht. O people, have I conveyed the issue to you guys? O oh Allah, have I conveyed the message? Qalu na'am, the Sahabas, they said, yes, you have conveyed it to us. The Prophet repeated this question, Allahumma hal ballakht. Have I conveyed the message to you? Allahumma hal ballakht. Have I conveyed the message to you, O people? Qalu na'am, the people, they said, yes, you did. And then he said, Allahumma shad. O oh Allah, be my witness. Three times, Allahumma. Allahumma shad. Allahumma shad. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said to the companions, فَلْيُبَلِّغِ الشَّاهِدُ الْغَائِبِ The one who is present convey to the one who is absent. In this that it teaches us that we're just, even us, we're conveying on what the Prophet taught us alayhi salatu wa sallam. The Prophet praised the one who conveys this message. Ibn Mas'ud narrated it. نَضَّرَ اللَّهُ مْرَأَنْ سَمِعَ مِنَّا شَيْئًا فَبَلَّغَهُ كَمَا سَمِعَهُ فَرُبَّ مُبَلَّغٍ أَوْ آلَهُ مِنْ سَامِعٍ That a person who conveys, the Prophet said, may the face shine of a person who hears my message and he conveys it as he heard it. Then the Prophet said, فَرُبَّ مُبَلَّغٍ uh, it's possible that a conveyor who's conveying فَرُبَّ مُبَلَّغٍ That it's possible a conveyor who's conveying أَوْعَى is more understanding لَهُ مِنْ سَامِعٍ So Nani, you're conveyed to someone who understands it better than you Tirmidhi narrated in Ibn Majah the, What's this Sharia? What are the characteristics that this Sharia has? And these are very important points you have to okay. understand There are three qualities that this Sharia has then you won't have people con con conflating the view of the scholar against the Sharia and etc. This puts down a powerful foundation for us. What are the characteristics of the Sharia? The characteristics of the Sharia are three things. al wal umum wal kamal. These are qualities of the Sharia. The first is that the Sharia is baqa, it will remain forever. So some people might kind of give you the impression that the Imams when they came that this is the Sharia, no. The Sharia was made إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَرِثَ اللَّهُ الْأَرْضَ وَمَنْ عَلَيْهَا Nabi Allah Muhammad was sent until the day of judgment. Allah says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا Muhammad is not the father of any one of you. Uh, he's a messenger from Allah and he's the final and last messenger. Mean, he, meaning him being the last and final messenger, it means that his message is made for until the day of judgment. Also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, it's found in Bukhari. The Prophet said, Man illahu bihi khayran. Anyone who Allah wants good for them, yufaqihu fi deen. Allah gives them the understanding of the religion. Allah makes them understand the deen. Wa innama ana qasimun wallahu yu'ti. The Prophet said, I am only. Wa innama, I am nothing except the Prophet saying this. Ana qasimun. I divide that knowledge to the people. I scatter it to the people. I spread it out to the people. Wallahu yu'ti. But Allah gives each person a portion of that knowledge. Then the Prophet, and this is the part that went from the baqa, the remaining of this religion, which is وَلَن تَزَالَ هَذِي الْأُمَّةِ قَائِمَةً عَلَىٰ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ لَا يَضُرُّهُ مَنْ خَالَفُهُمْ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ There will always be a people who are standing upon the commandments of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. No one can harm them who tries to oppose them. حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ Another wording in Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said حَتَّى تَقُومَ السَّاعَةِ Until the hour comes. And then this religion is going to carry on until the hour comes. The second quality that this Sharia has. And it's going to have is al umum. It's general. It's not for a specific group of people. And the umum, of the, the umum of the Sharia is in two ways. The first one is it's umum for everything they need. Mm. And the second one is this religion is umum for every and every single person. It's not for just the Arabs and the Arabs. And it's not only for the Indians. And it's not only for the Africans. And it's not only for the Europeans. It's for everybody. And the ayah Allah Taala showed us that this message is am. Allah says, "Wallahu yad'u ila dar salam, wa yahdi man yasha ila sirat mustaqim." Allah says, "Wallahu yad'u." Allah calls. Here we have the the fa'il, the one who's calling, which is Allah, mm -hmm. and we have yad'u, which is a fi'il mudariyah. But we don't have the maf'ul. Who is Allah calling? And the scholars they say the hadful maf'ul, the removing of the maf'ul. The reason why sometimes it's done is لِإِفَادَةِ umum, so it can benefit generalization. Meaning, Allah wants it to keep it open right. so everybody can enter there. Mm -hmm. This is one of the ayahs that the scholars take from it. Wallahu yad'u that there's two types of groups of people. There's ummatu da'wah and ummatu al-ijabah. Yani, there are people who are called and they rejected the message. They're called ummatu da'wah. And there is a people who were called and they accepted the message. They're called ummatu al-ijabah. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا الَّذِي لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتِ فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ النَّبِيِّ الْأُمِّيِّ الَّذِي يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَكَلِمَاتِ وَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَاتَّبِعُوهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَدُونَ the Prophet Sallallahu was commanded to say to the people, Inni Rasulullah ilaykum jami'an. I am a messenger and a prophet to all of you. Okay. Muslim narrated in his Sahih min hadith Abi Huraira that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Walladhi nafsu Muhammadun biyadi. I swear by the Lord that Muhammad's soul is in his hand. La yasma'u bi ahadun min hadhi al-ummati yahudiyun wa la nasraniyun thumma yamutu wa lam yu'min billadhi ursiltu bihi illa kana min ashab al-nar. The Prophet said, I swear by the Lord in which my soul is in his hand. No one hears about me whether he's a Christian or a Jew, and he does not, and he dies, and he doesn't believe in what I sent, what I was sent with, except that he's going to be from the dwellers of the hellfire. Mm-hmm. This shows that the Prophet ﷺ was sent to the Christians and the Jews, and he was sent to everybody. So now I come to the last and final point, which is this religion is complete. It doesn't need anyone to add anything to it. Allah said, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا Today I have completed your religion unto you, and I have fully established onto you my blessing and I am pleased for Islam as a religion. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah he said, هذه أكبر نعم الله this is the greatest blessings of Allah upon the people. على هذه الأمة حيث أكمل لها تعالى لهم دينهم فلا يحتاجون إلى دين غيره ولا إلى نبي غير نبيهم صلوات الله وسلام عليه ولهذا جعل الله خاتم الأنبياء وبعثه إلى الإنس والجن فلا حلال إلا ما أحله ولا حرام إلا ما حرمه ولا دين إلا ما شرعه وكل شيء أخبر به فهو حق وصدق لا كذب فيه ولا خلف. Ibn Kathirin, he said that this is the greatest blessing of Allah upon this ummah. He completed their religion for them. Allah wa ta'ala. وَفَلَا يَحْتَاجُونَ إِلَىٰ دِينٍ غَيْرِهِ They don't need any religion other than this. They do not need وَلَا إِلَىٰ نَبِيٍّ غَيْرِ نَبِيِّهِمْ They don't need any prophet other than Nabi Allah Muhammad صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهُ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيْهِ وَلِذَلِكَ Allah made him خَاتَمَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ The last and final prophet. Allah sent him to what? إِلَىٰ الْإِنْسِ وَالْجِنِّ Allah sent him to the mankind, the humans and the jinn. There is no halal except that which he made halal. وَلَا حَرَامَ إِلَّا مَا حَرَّمَهُ There is no haram except that which Muhammad conveyed to us. Salawatu Allah wa sallam. وَلَا دِينَ There is no religion إِلَّا مَا شَرَعَهُ Except that which he legislated. وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ أَخْبَرَ بِهِ Everything he told us about. فَوَحَقٌ وَصِدْقٌ It is true. We believe in it. لَا كَذِبَ فِيهِ There is no doubt in it. There is no lie in it. وَلَا خُلْفٌ Anyone who adds anything to this religion, it won't be accepted from him. مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلَ لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوا رَدْ The Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, مَنْ أَحَدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدٌ Any imam, kainam man kana, whoever he is, if he adds anything onto the religion, it won't be accepted from him. Mm-hmm. Because the religion is for everybody, it's complete, and it will stay for the, until the Day of Judgment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam made sure when he came to the people, he told them everything. Salman radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, uh, a Jew man said to him, قِيلَ لَهُ said to him, قَدْ عَلَّمَكُمْ نَبِيُّكُمْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Did your Prophet teach you everything? حَتَّى الْخِرَاءَ How to do your call of nature. He even taught you, taught, taught you how to do your call of nature. And you have to understand that a Prophet, people are waging war on him from all corners and from all directions. He takes time out to teach his companions call of nature. Salman al-Farisi said, Ajal, of course he did. لَقَدْ نَهَانَا أَنَّ نَسْتَقْبِلَ الْقِبْلَةَ لِغَائِطٍ أَوْ وَوْلٍ أَوْ أَنَّ نَسْتَنْجِي بِالْيَمِينِ أَوْ أَنَّ نَسْتَنْجِي بِأَقَلِّ مِنْ ثَلَاثَةَ أَحْجَارٍ أَوْ أَنَّ نَسْتَنْجِي بِرَجِيعٍ أَوْ بِعَظْمٍ Yes. Now our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he prohibited us from facing the Qibla whilst doing our call of nature. Whether we're doing uh, our, yani, whatever we're doing from our call of nature. Mm-hmm. Or for us to use our right hands. He told, he prohibited us from it, Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He prohibited us from using less than three stones. Salawatullahi wa sallam alayhi. وَلِذَلِكَ this Qur'an came down and it clarified everything through the Prophet when Allah said وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبْيَانَ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرَى لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died And he passed away Tarakana Rasulullah And he left us on Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Wa ma ta'ili yuqallibu janahahi fil hawa'i illa Wa huwa yudhakkiruna minhu ilma Ibn Hibban related it Abu Dhar said the Prophet passed away And there is no bird that flaps its wing in the sky Except that he told us something about it Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi So this all gives us an understanding That this religion is complete okay. This religion is going to remain the legislator, the one who sanctions is Allah Azza wa Jalla. Everybody else's speech, we look at it, we accept it. If it's right, we take it. If it's wrong, we reject it. The difference between the Prophet and the scholars is three things. The first one is that the Prophets are ma'asumin. They are infallible, they don't do mistakes. Whereas the scholars, they do mistakes. However high they are, anyone after the Prophet is open to do mistakes. We question their verdicts. 
We don't do that with the Prophet. The second difference is that Nabiullahi Muhammad, he has revelation supporting him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani whatever he says, everything he spoke is wahyu min Allah. Scholars, they do not have um, uh, revelation to support them in everything they say. So they, they, they depend on, they depend on independent reasoning in situations and they get it right or wrong. Whereas the Prophet, when he speaks, it's revelation from Allah tabaraka, tabaraka wa ta'ala. Hmm. The third difference between the Prophet and the scholars is that the scholars, their statements, it can perish, it can go mm -hmm. and it wear out. Whereas the prophets, and in Nabi Muhammad, Abadan, his ahkam and everything was made forever. A scholar might give a verdict right now, and 10 years later, that verdict might be seen as to not be appropriate because things have changed sure. because of it. Okay. If you understand those three points I mentioned, you'll understand that you won't either fall into fanaticism towards the Imams of Islam who came, who we, we benefit from. And you will also not fall into the concept of unrestricted okay. ijtihad for every and every. Last point you asked me, and I'm going to respond okay. to you right now, is that what is tamadhub? Yeah. And what's the meaning of tamadhub? Tamadhub, it comes from the master, the verbal noun of uh, tamadhaba, uh, which is in the form of or the structure of the word tamaf'ala. And the word tamaf'ala means al idhar wal akhd. It's to show. Um, in Arabic language It means to show and express It is also to take it also has that meaning That's what it means in the language But what it means in the Stilah of the ulama When they use it Is According to the scholars When they say tamadhub They basically mean It's to follow the usul The foundation of an imam Okay His principles and extracting things based on his principles. In other words, tamadhub, it goes back to two things. Usul al-istidlal al-fiqhi and al-furu' al-fiqhiyah. It goes back to the principles of a particular imam, whether it be Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, or Ahmed. Yani the usul he used, the principles that he used. And the furu' al-fiqhiyah, which is the... Uh, the furu' al fiqhiyah means the fiqh that was extracted from the usul that was taken from it. So sometimes the imam, he mentions al furu' al fiqhiyah and sometimes he mentions usul. And the scholars, in situations, they go back to those two and they extract from it rulings and issues. Okay. So a madhab is someone's, one of these imams, an imam's principles that he uses to determine legislative rulings in the religion. This is halal, this is haram, things like that. Yes. Okay. I think that's a really important introduction. Um, and I don't think any Muslim within the mainstream kind of Sunni Islam would disagree with anything you've said so far, that the Quran and the Sunnah should be ultimately followed. And that the Quran and the Sunnah are from Allah and a statement of a scholar is, you know, can be rejected, can be accepted. However, having said that, I think the issue comes is when you try and practically apply this, because as we know, no, not you know, the overwhelming majority of the Muslims on earth today are not able to go to the Quran and the Sunnah directly and extract rulings. Therefore, they need a person in the middle. They need an interpreter. They need someone who's going to convey what they should be doing. They need someone who has the ability to go to the text and then break it down and tell the Muslims what they should be doing. And this is where the Imams come in. And so this issue of tamadhub and people following a madhab, a lot of people believe it is necessity to follow a madhab because they have no other choice because they can't go to the Qur'an and the Sunnah directly. What do you have to say about that? So what I want inshallah ta'ala to do in order to answer your question is that we have to take a step back. We have to divide the people. The okay. people are three types. There's the ammi, the general folk, the general mass who doesn't know anything of the religion. Maybe a new Muslim that took Islam. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he's a born Muslim, but he's never studied about Islam. Sure. He's a ammi. He wouldn't know if an ayah was read or a hadith was read. He wouldn't know which one is. He doesn't understand anything. He's an ammi. That's one camp. Then the second camp of people we have is we have a group we call the mutabi'ah. A mutabi'ah is a person who's a student of knowledge. He studied, he learned, he has some knowledge. 
And then we have the scholar. By dividing those three people, it gives us understanding. Where did this second middle group come from? Because as I understand it, you're either a scholar who's able to go directly to text like a mujtahid, or you have to make taqlid. You have to blind follow someone who has the ability to go into the text. You're saying there's a second category in the middle. Okay. Where did you get this from? Okay. Let's, let's, the work and the reality of the people shows us this. No problem. As great scholars, muhaqiqin, like Ibn Abdul Barr, rahimahullah, mentions in his kitab, Jama'a Bayan al-Ilm al-Fadri, Ibn al-Qayy mentions in his I'lam al muqin And the work and the reality that we're in does show us that. For example, we have a, you're right, by the way, it's not agreed upon. These three categorizations are not agreed upon by all scholars. Some scholars only believe there's a mujtahid and there's a muqallid. Khalas. There's nothing between that. But as I mentioned, Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn Abdul Barr mention it, and I think the, that Taqseem is more accurate for the reality that we see. Let's okay. tackle it. Yeah, let's go into it. The Ammi, la madhaba lahu. What does that mean? Hmm. The Ammi, the general mass, he shouldn't follow any madhab. He just has to go to his local imam and ask his local imam and do exactly what his local imam tells him. Blind follow his local imam. He doesn't know anything. Either if, if the imam explains things to him and tries to expand onto issues for him, he wouldn't know. So he is a person who just, because the ayah instructed him, go and ask the people of knowledge. Yeah. He was commanded to do that and he goes and he does that. Okay. That's the ami. Him to follow a madhab and all of that wouldn't understand it. And this whole discussion that we're having right now won't make sense for him. Okay. He just goes to his local imam and he says to his local imam, I'm married, my wife and I, this has issue. What do you think? The imam will explain it for him. Okay. Okay. He's one, as the poet said, uh, he just goes to a person who combined between knowledge and piety. خلص. Okay. And he asks him, Sahib al Maraqi mentioned. The second type is a mutabi'ah. A mutabi'ah is a person who can look at the delil hmm. of each party. So he's able to look at, for example, Ahmad ibn Hanbal said this. Okay. And the madhab of the Hanabila mentioned this. And he's able to look at their evidences that they provide. To get to that level, that's not a, it's not a low level for someone. Do they need the Arabic language for that? Yeah, they need, there's all these conditions that the scholars mentioned. He has to know Usul al-Fiqh. Uh, uh, he has to study Usul al-Fiqh. He has to study Arabic language. He has to have, يعني, and he has to have a lot so of science. So most people in their lifetime won't even get to this stage. I mean, this, we, this is it's for you to say that they need these kind of science. No, this person is not going to the evidence directly himself. Agreed, but even just to get to this stage where they understand what the opinions of the imams are and are able to make some kind of judgment on this is strong. Again, it's, it, changes, a high level. It, it changes from one person to another. It also ch changes from the availability for each person. Some person, uh, one particular person might live in a land where there are mujtahideen and so he's able to see the discussion happening between them. So it makes it easier for him. Another person won't, may not have that, so he has to go through the books and read it, uh, and etc. I mean, it also goes back to the person's mind. Is he sharp? Is he smart? Is he clever? Is he dedicated? Does he have it in him? And I can't give 10 years it will take, or five years. Some, someone okay. could do it in a very short period of time. But you're right, there are conditions for a person to be able to do that, which is that the person can look at a discussion happening between the ulama. So he'll see, for example, Madhab al Hanabila say uh, in an issue this thing. And he sees that Madhab al-Shafi'iyah, they believe this in this issue. Mm. So then what he does is that he writes down their each party's evidences and their principles that they're both using. Okay? Yeah. And he's able to strengthen one over the other. So based on the, what? Based on who's closer to the evidence. How does he know who's closer to the evidence? For example, one party is using a evidence that the other party hasn't come across. What if the other party also has an evidence that the other party hasn't heard of? So then now it goes to issue of ijtihad now. It's not just the khilaf anymore. Mm. The scholars call this a ijtihad. Now what happens is that this muttabi' if he's got a madhab that he follows, he's content with his madhab. So, this so for example, this, okay. if I have an issue where I feel the madhab of the Hanabil have a very strong view on this issue and the Shafi'i madhab have a very strong, and I personally can't, there are situations like that for me where I can't reach a conclusion in this issue. In that case, you would? I would just stick to the ma Shafi'i Madhab. That's your Madhab? I, that's the Madhab I follow. You're just doing that just because this is the one you choose? No, but my, my knowledge and my ability in this issue can't reach that point of looking at the evidence and to 
I, has it become clear you to don't me? see that as problematic I'm just going to blind follow Imam Shafi in this just because I like him more than the other three and I don't know what to do in this issue so let me just stick to him that's no, Ta'asub I'm, no I'm Ta'asub is different see this is called Tamadhub Ta'asub by the way by Barakallahu Feek and Tamadhub first of all there are terms that we need to kind of okay you're right yeah, yeah I need to separate one from the other which is Ta'asub means fanaticism I'm not fanatic to Shafi I believe he can get it right or wrong I believe Shafi'i can be right or can be wrong. I'm not saying Shafi'i is infallible from mistakes. By the way, he himself, Shafi'i claimed, said in his kitab, Jumma'ul Ilm, Rahimahullah, Rahmatan Wasi'ah, he said, Shafi'i, he said that no one can claim that they've memorized the entire hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Okay. And in the Quran, you can claim to memorize it all in his qiraat and all of you can. The Quran, Allahumma barik, we have many people who have the whole entire Quran in their chest. They also have the different qiraat in their chest, alhamdulillah. But we don't have anyone on the face of this earth, historically, no one, has, who has memorized the entire hadith of the Prophet. So there's always going to be a portion of hadith missing from you. Mm. Okay, You might even have memorized that hadith but forgot it. Okay. So the imam is, and the hadith is a source of legislation, is it not? Yeah, it is. And that's where you get your evidences from. Mm -hmm. So if, it's, if an evidence is missing from you, it will affect your verdict, right? Of course, yeah. So... Shafi'i, I'm not saying he's infallible. I'm saying he is kullun yu'khadu min qawlihi. Everyone, is, his speech is either taken or rejected. And Shafi'i falls under that. He's no exception to that. Okay. But when I came to an issue and it became clear to me that I am not yet able to see who is rajih and who is marjuh. Hmm. Are you there? Who's yeah. rajih and who's marjuh? Which means in English? I don't know which one's stronger and which one's weaker. Okay. It hasn't become clear to me. I now become an ami in this issue. Okay. Or I become a muqallid in this issue. Okay. I understand Shafi'i brought evidences. I trust him in his righteousness and his nobility, and I trust him in his taqwa and deen. Just like you would trust Ahmed. But with on top of that, I strengthen the usul of Shafi'i more than oh. the usul of Ahmed. Okay. Ahmed has an usul that he builds things on. Yeah. That I think is, remember again, I said tamadhub is usul al istidlal al fiqhi and furu' al fiqhiyah. Mm -hmm. The usul al istidlal al fiqhi, I am more leaning towards Shafi'i over Ahmed's usul al istidlal al fiqhi. So when the issue doesn't become clear to me, I lean towards. What him. basis are you leaning towards him more than this? Because you're from Somalia, or is there another reason? No, no, a personal qanaa. And again, the issue of choosing madhab, I will speak about that inshallah ta'ala. What makes a person, how can a person choose a madhab, which is, I think, something to choose. Um, but the reason I came to that conclusion of following the Shafi'i Madhab is nothing to do with the necessarily because of the region I'm from. <laughs> yeah. It played a role, I'm not mm -hmm. going to deny it, uh, but it's qana'a nafsi. I'm personally content with the usul al-istidlal that an Imam al-Shafi'i has. Isn't this the whole, one of the big problems with this issue? That you're obviously, like you said, it played a role, right? And we can see that the work of the reality just shows us that, that a lot of people from Somalia pick Imam Shafi. A lot of people from Pakistan, India pick Abu Hanifa. Yeah. This is an issue of deen. Yeah. Where we're from should not come into it. It shouldn't play a role. Aslan, it should not play a role at all. Isn't this part of an issue that you yourself are just saying right now that you've fallen into? No, That's problematic for me. The uh, Okay. This Quran and Sunnah, they need understanding. Okay. What do they need? Understanding. They need understanding. And when you look at the ulama who came in Islam, we just in our last podcast we spoke about some issues uh, related to great scholars of Islam. I told you when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam died, he died in the city of Medina. Mm. And when the Prophet died in Medina alayhi salatu a madhab came out from that city. It's called Madhabu Ahl al Hijaz, specifically Madhabu Ahl al Medina, mm. and the forefront for that was Imam Malik. Yeah. The madhab of Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala is madhab based on naql wa riwaya. It's based on transmission. There came another madhab which is madhab ahl al-Iraq if you more specific يعني madhab ahl al-Kufa the madhab of the people of Kufa run by Imam Abu Hanifa. Okay. Shafi'i and Ahmed have taken from both. Specifically Imam Shafi'i. Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala his madhab was that he studied from Imam Malik directly, was a student of his, memorized his muwatta, he read it on him. So he directly took from him the concept of al-riwayah wa naql, transmission and narrations. That's one. 
And then Shafi'i rahimahullah went and he took knowledge from who? Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa rahimahullah students. He didn't meet Abu Hanifa because okay. the year Abu Hanifa died was the year Imam Malik was, uh, Imam Shafi'i was born. Yeah. And 150 Hijriyah was the year which Shafi'i was born and that was the same year a great Imam Abu Hanifa was born. But died. Uh, it was, uh, Abu Hanifa died, sorry. Yeah. It was the year Abu Hanifa died and it was the year Imam Shafi'i was born. So he never met uh, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa but he met the students of Al-Imam uh, Abu Hanifa like uh, Qadi Abu Yusuf the great jurist and the great faqih he also met Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani the great alim Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani and Shafi'i had discussions and dialogues back and forth which is documented it's written here you learn from Al-Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala that he jama'a bayna al-madrasatayn he has both madrasa Hmm. Hence why he became the first person to write the greatest science to in the greatest science to aid a person to extract rulings from the uh, Quran and the Sunnah, which is known as Usul al Fiqh. Shafi'i was the first person to come out and he wrote a science called Usul al Fiqh. Okay. This science of Usul al Fiqh, what is it? Usul al Fiqh is Ahl al-Riwaya, يعني Ahl al-Medina, they had naqal, they had the, the, the al-Fadh, the Hanith. And the people of Abu Hanifa, Ahl al-Iraq, they had the concept of extracting istimbat and istikharaj, and they were good at that. Shafi'i brought for them a way to do it, to do this in a very respectful, disciplined manner. Mm. Because without a shadow of a doubt, the madhabs that were there, they suffered from two things which is al-jumudu fil al Sometimes it was stubborn on wordings. And another madhab was at tawassu fil al They were over, going overboard with the wording. Right. For example, uh, at tawassu fil al would be, for example, the fatwa that was, uh, يعني, the one who said, وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا Allah made the night uh, a clothing. And he said, you can pray in a dark room naked. You don't have to wear clothings. If you're praying in a room which is pitch dark, you don't have to necessarily wear clothing because Allah said in the Quran this is tawassu' fil lafz it's going extreme in the wording right. and you have jumud also stubbornness on the wording you know that's what, what I mean jumud means your person being too harsh on the wording of the yeah. hadith or the ayah and an example for that was Ibn Hazm in what he said about uh, the bikr the virgin girl the virgin girl her father will come to her and say to her, listen, I, there's a brother who asked for your hand in marriage. What do you think? And the virgin, the virgin girl in the hadith, it mentions that her permission is her what? It's her silence. And the virgin girl, because she's never been married and she's shy, she, when her father tells her she blushes, she turns away, she covers her face, but that's her confirmation. Okay. Yeah. Ibn Hazmin said, if she says, dad, I do want... So if she says yes. Yeah, yeah. If she says yes, yeah. I, Abi, I do want that brother. He says that's null and void. And the hadith clearly said her silence is her, her silence, her affirmation. Hmm. That's jumu. That's stubbornness on the wedding. Yeah. Shafi'i is usul, and one of the reasons. There's many reasons I can speak about okay. it for very long. Like in Shafi'i is that his usul is mustaqim. His usul al istidlal al fiqhi is very qawi. Okay. When I say to you, I'm a Shafi'i and I follow the Shafi'i madhab, I mean the usul al istidlal al fiqhi is Shafi'i. Okay. The usul I'm upon. Like in al furu' al fiqhi, I can sometimes disagree with Shafi'i. How do, how do you stay consistent? How can you say, I'm going to take his usul, but I'm not going to follow that all the way through the process and I'm going to take. The nas governs me. The uh, nas... Uh, isn't that contradictory? No, it's not. For example, Imam Abu Hanifa has his own usul, which uh, is different to Imam Shafi's uh, usul. Uh, You're taking, you believe Imam Shafi's usul is better and stronger. Who? Shafi. Yeah, but I believe Shafi is. The and best. then on one issue, like for example, the issue of. By the way, when I say Shafi is the best, and I, again, this is another issue that I want to go into, which is the issue of al mufadala bayn al madahib mm. And we, we saw this. <laughs> There's a kitab written by Abi Ma'ali al joini where he called it Murith al Khalq fi Tarjih al Qawl al Haq, where he says that Shafi'i is the best. Abi Ma'ali al joini the Sahib al Sahib al Waraqat. Yeah. yeah. And he virtues Shafi'i. When I say the usul of Shafi'i is the best, it doesn't mean unrestrictedly. Okay. There are many usuls that Shafi'i I don't agree with. And I think this usul of the Hanabila is better. Um, يعني the Shafi'i is not the. يعني there's usul. Also, after <laughs> Abi Ma'ali Jwaini gave unrestricted virtue to the Shafi'i Madhab, 
سبت الجوزي روت كتاب كود الانتصار والترجيح للمذهب الصحيح وهي سترينثز ذا حنفي مذهب سيز اوسو محمد زاهد الكوثري والهالك هي اوسو روت كتاب ان جيفن فيرتيو ذا بيز فاناتيك اوكي ان جيفن ذا حنفي مذهب اوكي اند ذن افتر كيم محمد بن محمد الراعي الاندلسي روت كتاب كود الانتصار الفقير السالك لترجيح مذهب الامام مالك وهي كيم اند سيد مذهب امام مالك از ذا بيست اند ذير از نوثينج لايك ات ابن مفلح The author of Sahib al Furu' in the Madhab of Imam Abu Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah. In Kitab al Ridda, the chapter of apostasy, he mentions at the ending of it, he mentions in Al Haqqa fi Ahad al In Al Haqqa fi Ahad al Madahib al Arba'a. He said that anyone who says, and the man qala, anyone who says, in Al Haqqa fi Ahad al Madahib al Arba'a, that the truth is in one of four, the four Madhabs. Anyone who says this. Duna ma'adahu in any other, and he says, this madhab is the best over any of the other madhab yeah. who claims that فَإِنَّهُ يَجِبُ عَلَيْ فَإِنَّهُ يَجِبُ أَنْ يُسْتَتَابُ وَإِلَّا يُؤَدَّبْ He should be asked to repent or he's disciplined. Okay. The leader might imprison him, yeah. <laughs> lash him. It's not a joke. Yeah. So I, I'm not here saying that the Hashafi'i madhab is unrestrictedly okay. the best madhab. Yeah, I, I won't claim that because there are quite a few issues which I uh, disagree with the Shafi'i madhab. But the usul of an Imam al-Shafi'i, yeah. the usul al-istilal al-fiqhi, Shafi'i seems to be... No problem. يعني... Okay, I want to go back to my question. You have usul and furu' from each madhab. You, ha- you say you want to go with the usul of Shafi'i, but in some of the furu' you might take Abu Hanifa's opinion, for example. نعم. That has been built upon different usul. You're, and now you're contradictory because you'd like this usul, but you want this furu'. Mm. That for me is contradictory because you've actually left the usul that you agree with hmm. and gone to someone else's usul which you disagree with okay. and taken their verdict. Okay, let me explain something to you now. Go on. There's a slight con- contradiction that's happening to you right okay, now. Okay, go on. Is that you're conflating a tamadhub with, with taqlid. Okay, what do you mean by that? You're saying tamadhub and taqlid are one and the other. Yeah, hmm. I mean, this is one of the mistakes that many people fall into. They believe tamadhub means automatically taqlid. When they speak about tamadhub, they always bring the ayat and the nusus that have come down that rebuke blind following. So they say tamadhub is always blind following. No. Right, I see. And we don't believe tamadhub is blind following. Tamadhub is uh, not the same as blind following. Like it's not, like it doesn't mean that tamadhub and taqlid are one or the other. No. And there are differences between the two. For example, tamadhub is following a madrasa. Whereas taqlid, you're following a person. Pay attention to that. Mm-hmm. Tamadhub means I'm following a madrasa. A madrasa. This so madrasa has been going on for 1,300 something years. Mm-hmm. Okay. Taqlid means one individual. I'm holding on to him. Also, taqlid, blind following, it doesn't allow a person to think and do ijtihad and work. Whereas tamadhub, You do ijtihad and you work hard. Well, we find people who follow the madhabs actually became mujtahideen later. I see. We don't find anyone who sticks as a blind follower to ever be a, 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 a mujtahid. I'll give you an example. Tajidin al-Subki, in his tabaqat, he mentioned, he said, al-Muhammadun al-Arba. He said, the four Muhammads. Who are these four Muhammads? Muhammad ibn Nasr al-Marwazi, and Muhammad ibn Jalil al-Tabari, and Muhammad ibn, uh, ibn uh, Ishaq ibn Khuzayma and Muhammad ibn al-Mundir. These are four Muhammad, right? He said, said that uh, Tajuddin al-Subki said, min ashabina, they are our ashab, meaning Shafi'iya. Okay. These four are Shafi'iya. Qad balagu darajat al-ijtihad. They reached the level of ijtihad. Al-mutlaq. These men have reached unrestricted ijtihad. And when we say the ijtihad is two, the mujtahid is two types. There's a mujtahid which is muqayyid, and he's muqayyid fi madhabin. He's a mujtahid within the madhab, nowhere else. And there is the mujtahid mutlaq. He doesn't, he looks at the Quran and the Sunnah extraction. Right, right, okay. But he said at the beginning, what? Min ashabina, they are our, from us, the Shafi'iyya. Qad balagu darajat al-ijtihad, they reach the level of ijtihad, al-mutlaq. Wa lam yukhrijuhum dhalika an kawni min ashab al-shafi'i. Even though they reached the level of ijtihad, and mutlaq, it didn't stop them from being what? From the Shafi'i madhab. Al-mukharrijina ala usulihi al-mutamadhibina bi madhabi li wafaqi ijtihadim ijtihada. Pay attention to that. So what I mean from that is that tamadhub can, if it's used correctly, if it's understood correctly, it can lead, it can be a stepping stone to uh, ijtihad al-mutlaq, to okay. become a mujtahid mutlaq. When you use tamadhub as taqlid, blind following, it becomes a problem. So when I say to you 
the Alimam al-Shafi'i, I follow his usul. First of all, I don't believe his usul, his usul al-istidlal al-fiqhi is muttarid. Yani in every single usul that he mentions, it applies on everything. Right, There's okay. like exceptions that, that, that are in generally principles. You've probably studied that in Qawaid al fiqhiyah and also in usul al-fiqh. Mm -hmm. Second thing is that within the Shafi'i madhab itself, within the Shafi'i madhab itself, there's always going to be a person who's going to disagree with the Imam, who are upon his madhab. Like for example, if you go to an Imam, uh, an Imam al Nawawi, rahimahullah, an Imam al Nawawi, what is he in the madhab Shafi'iyah? Allahu Akbar. Mm. And he you can actually say the Mutaakhirina, the late Shafi'iyah today, are really, they are. Um, Living off his works, kind of. Nawawi or Rafi'i. Well, a man even said, he said, Nawawiyah to la Nabawiyah. Hmm. The people are what? Nab Nawawiyatun They are Nawawis Not Nabawiyah yeah. They're not on the Prophet's way yeah. And Shafi'iyah And that's not a praiseworthy thing yeah. It should be upon the way Of the Prophet But Al-Imam Al-Nawawi Rahimahullah Ta'ala When it came to Lahmu uh, uh, When it came to Lahm uh, Al-Jazur Aklu Lahm Al-Jazur yani, Do you do wudu from it or not? Shafi'i connected that To the authentication of the hadith Shafi'i said, if the hadith is sahih, mm -hmm. it's one of the things, Shafi'i, there's a few things that he said, if, it's, if this is sahih, that's my madhab. Okay. Nawawi, Nawawi authenticated it, rahimahullah ta'ala, the hadith. And then he said, this is what Shafi'i would have said if he's alive. And I'm upon the madhab of Imam Shafi'i. Wabihi aqulu, and I say this. Well, mm -hmm. Bayhaqi even said, yani, is, this is a hadith in Sunan al-Kubra al-Bayhaqi. And he said, this hadith is sahih. And if Shafi'i was alive, he would have taken it. Hmm. And then he, even Nawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, he says, إِذَا صَحَ الْحَدِيثُ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِ Subki has a kitab called, uh, قَوْلُ الْمُطَّلِبِي إِذَا صَحَ الْحَدِيثُ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِي In there, he brings that example of Nawi that I mentioned of Lahm al okay. So what I mean by all of that is that Tamadhub has been used in a wrong way. It has been used in a wrong way. And it can also be used in a right way. Hmm. These great four in Muhammad I mentioned, all four of them became mujtahid mutlaq, unrestricted mujtahideen, okay. who were able to use the Quran and the Sunnah and speak about it. Now, okay, I really want to go back because I know we digress, and I have a feeling that's going to happen a lot in this podcast. But I want to go back to those three groups of people: the muqallid, the one who is a basic ami who has to blind follow. He asks his local imam, as you put it. The Muttabi'ah, who we've been talking about quite a lot, mm -hmm. and I get the feeling from this podcast that that's kind of the category you put yourself in sometimes. And like you said, sometimes you have to make taqlid on certain issues as well. Mm -hmm. And in the mujtahid. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to be talking about the mujtahid too much. I think we'll go in. Uh, I've got a question at the end about the mujtahid. But I would be surprised if any mujtahideen are watching our podcast. And if they are, I suggest that they shouldn't be. They should be doing something else. But the mujtabi'ah, the follower, we've been speaking about that. And that is a level where you can go into either the books or to the imams. And then basically try and... You know, take which one you believe is strongest based on your principles or the evidences, etc. The muqallid. I believe most people will fall into this category. This person, you said there's no issue with him just asking his imam. For example, there's a there's a brother who has an imam who's Pakistani, for example. He knows this imam only takes from Abu Hanifa. He's got ta'asub upon the madhab of Abu Hanifa. This person, can he use this imam and just ask him everything? What's the delay? What's the what, sorry? What's the ruling of this? What's <coughs> ruling? No, why not? But because you said that he has to blind follow someone. Yeah, but that's what I say. You have to understand. He can't ask a person who's a blind follow himself. Okay. He has to person ask a person who's a stu stu scholar, a okay. person of knowledge. A muqallid, as Ibn Abdul Bar mentioned, his kitab Jam'u Bayan al Ulmi wa Fadli. A muqallid la yu the person who's a muqallid, laysa fi jumlatil ulama. He's not considered from the scholars. He's not considered from a person of knowledge. Asli. Right. He's. He's still considered from the amateur. He's right? still in the first level himself, yeah, yeah, yeah. regardless whether he's an imam. An imam. It doesn't matter. Okay. So he has to ask a person who's muttabi'u li dalil follows the Quran and the Sunnah, yani who uses the kalam of the ulama to understand the Quran and the Sunnah. He has to go to that person. That's why okay. the poet Sahib al Maraqi would say, وَلَيْسَ فِي فَتْوَاهُ مُفْتِ مُتَّبَعُ مَا لَمْ يُضِفْ لِلْعِلْمِ وَالدِّينِ الْوَرَى So he's gone to a person of deen and ilm. The person's got religion and he's a pious individual and he's got knowledge. Combined between that two. So this person is halal, he eats halal. He's not alcoholic, he's not smoking. And somebody might know all of the madahibs and all the aqwals and all the views and everything. Might be knowledgeable. Hmm. You don't give you don't listen to that. If he's drinking alcohol and he's smoking okay. and, okay. and he, he has to go to somebody of religion and someone who has 
uh, uh, piety and someone who's got knowledge. Knowledge. And, that, and part of that knowledge is not to just be a blind follow himself. He has to have enough knowledge to be able to move. Yeah, 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 okay. it's true. Yeah, okay. uh, now, uh, there's something that you said in your statement I, I kind of want to point out, which is this concept of the four madhabs. I don't believe that, that the haq is only restricted to the four madhabs, Aslan. Okay. This is something yeah, and he, some scholars have mentioned that that the truth is connected to the four madhabs and it's not allowed for you to leave the four madhabs. And in one poet he said, It's even Sahib al Maraqi, he said in his Al Fiya Al Usuliya that he has Maraqi Su'ud li Mubta Ruqi wa Su'ud. He says, Wal Mujma Uli Oma Alehi Arba'a. Which basically is There are some scholars like Abu Amr ibn Salah And Abu Faraj ibn Rajab al Hanbali uh, Who said that Following the four madhabs You have to stay within the four madhabs And Ibn Rajab al Hanbali He has a kitab called ala man al al arba'a, Refutation on the person who follows uh, Other than the four madhabs Abu Amr ibn Salah also had that opinion And Sahib al Maraqi, he brings an ijma' on this issue. And Al Nafarawi in Sharh al Risala, he brings an ijma' on this issue. And Abu Muhammad al Amin al Shanqiyatiyu, Rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, Al Muta'akhirun al Usuliyin min jami' al Madahibi Mutbikun kulluhum ala wujubi. That it's wajib to follow one of these four. Mm. The point I'm trying to say is that I, I don't believe that ijma' is true. Sahib al Maraqi's statement, which is, Wal Mujma' al Yom alayhi arba'a, wa qafu gayri al Jami'u Mana'a. I think that's not a correct How, What gives you the right to say that? It's yeah. ijma' it's a, it's a Where we take our religion from It's like saying I don't believe this sunnah Yeah Quran. I think Naqlul ijma' here is not sahih Because the opposite group Also transmitted ijma' On the opposite Did thing. they? Ibn Hazm brought the opposite Of that ijma' Who's came first? Um, Ibn Hazm is before Sahib al-Maraqi And Nafarawi And Ibn Rajab Is before all of those people So you're confusing me With your speech here Because how can you say That the truth is not Restricted to these four you have no other option. Allah got rid of the other madhab. Sufi and Athari's madhab's gone. Allah actually refined it so we only have these four left. You Isn't that Allah showing you that the truth is within these four? No. The truth's lost then? No, it's not. It's not that it's lost. What do you mean then? Explain I'm yourself. saying to you the truth doesn't mean it's restricted to these four. Yeah, I mean, some of the madhab is still being mentioned. Okay, like, it's, it's like so, which madhab? Sufi and Athari's views are mentioned. We have his, some of his views and issues. Layth ibn Sa'ad, we have some of his views in Israel. Abu Thawr in his madhab. We've got some of his views. We've got Ibn Jarir Tabri, some of his views. And those views are not found in any of the four madhab, you're saying? There some, are issues. Some issues that, yeah, really? we, do, we have their statements mentioned. Sufyan al Thawri gave this verdict. Awza'i gave this verdict on this issue. And it may not necessarily be the four. Hmm. So, restricting two things I want to mention. Restricting the truth to these four is baseless, and there's no evidence for that. What okay. about the argument that Allah has restricted it for you because he has made... Now the, the second part of the yeah. question is that you're not allowed to use the universal evidences to affirm a shari evidence. Explain yourself, what do you mean? You're saying that universally what took place historically, universally happened, mm. is that these madhabs it became only four. Okay? Yeah. You're using a universal occurrence and trying to bring from that a shari ruling. That's, that's not what we do. We don't even, do that. If, even if, like, what if you say that you can see oppressors b being punished? Oppressors? Yeah, there's oppression taking in a place in the land, for example, ah. and see the punishment of Allah coming. But there's a legislation prior to that. So that's a universal thing that Allah has brought down, right? But no, that's a, that's a, there's a, there's a legislation here as well. No, there's a, before this. No, but I'm saying that issue, yeah, go on. prior to the universal event, yeah. there's a legislation for it. Okay, let's break this down so that I just want the people to understand this. What I'm saying is that you have a people who are oppressing another, a nation and Allah is bringing this punishment among, amongst those people. Oh. I'm saying, my argument is that this is a universal event that Allah is bringing the punishment. Yes, yes, yes. You're saying, yes, that's fine, but that's because Allah says he's going to punish the oppressors. And that is a shara'an legislation. Mm. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So in that case, you can say this is happening because of that, because you have a text to prove it. No, I'm saying to you, saying that the four imams, the yeah. truth is restricted to them. Bring me an evidence from the Quran. Don't be in the universe. Which ijma? Okay, the fact that we need. By the way, this ijma is not the early scholars who mentioned this. Mm. This ijma was only mentioned after that. This ijma was between the, yani, uh, yani, it came in the sixth and the yani, sixth century onwards. Mm. There's no, and I said the opposite was also claimed, and also, um, Sir uh, Sir Alam Nubal Imam Al Dhahabi, he mentioned Ibn Abi Dhibin. 
an Imam Malik, just to show you that there's no consensus have to be followed these four. Ijma. Dhahabi mentions in his seer ala minubala, Ahmad ibn Hanbalin, it reached him that Ibn Abi Dhibbin said, and the Malik and Lam Yahud be Hadith al Bay al Bay Ani bil Khiari. Ahmad uh, Malik ibn Anas did not take the Hadith of al Bay Ani bil Khiari. Okay. That the person who's buying a product has a choice of returning the item uh, before he leaves. There's a, there's a, it's called Majlisul Khiyar, a choice. You have a, a choice. Do you want to buy the product while you're here? Check it out, look at it. No, I don't want to give me back my money. You've got that. Malik didn't take that hadith. For reasonable basis. For he him. had his reasons, right? Yeah, of course. Of course. He's not just going to reject the hadith. Yeah. Faqala, he said, Ibn Abi Dhibin, when he heard that, he said, Yustatab. Malik is asked to repent from this. Mm. If he does not repent from what he... But Imam Malik. Imam Malik. Or his head's going to be... Sorry, I cut you off with the English translation. He said, Yustatab. Malik is told to repent. فَإِنْتَابَ If he repents, Alhamdulillah. وَإِلَّا And if he refuses and he still holds on to the opinion, ضُرِبَتْ عُنُقُهُ Malik's head's going to be sliced. He's going to be killed for this. He rejects the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahmed then said, هُوَ أَرْوَعُ وَأَقْوَلُ بِالْحَقِّ مِنْ مَالِكٍ Ahmed was Ahmed here. He said that Ibn Abi Dhibin here is more wara' more on the safer side and the truth is with him than Malik <laughs> and Imam al Dhabi sometimes he, he takes things and he points out points against it Dhabi mm. got angry so he got angry and he responded to this he said Lo kala wari'an. Ahmed if Ibn Abi Dhibin was really a God-fearing person and he was on a and he, if he had wara' كما ينبي as it was as it should have been لما قال هذا القول القبيح في حق إمام العظيم يقول نفسي صرت لا يتسبع الإمام مالك a great إمام فمالك إنما لم يعمل بظاهر الحديث مالك did not act upon this hadith because he saw it لأنه رآه منسوخا he saw it, he saw it to be abrogated وقيل عمل به and it's also even said that he acted upon it وحمل قوله and he يعني used حتى يتفرق على التلفظ بالإجابة والقبول that they have to have said and he he went into the hadith and mm. used it in a different way okay the point I'm trying to say to you is the Imams of Islam was like they were tough on this issue of يعني, take the truth being on يعني, being the thing that is followed if Malik's qawl is a يعني, from he's one of the four right yeah Abi Dhib, why, why did Ibn Abi Dhib been say that about him the but, but there is, a, is there also the other opinion found in one of the other three which one the one uh, so he's he's not agreeing with Imam Malik's opinion on this issue huh. but the opinion that he is agreeing with is it found in the other three Yes, found in the other. Yeah, thing. so it's not left the four. No, Ibn Abi Dhib didn't say Malik Shafi'i said this, hmm. or another Imam said this, or some. He didn't use that. He said, "I've got the Hadith. The proof is but with you, me." You know, like this is. I think this is a crux of the issue here. That don't you think that even when you're talking about an issue where it's not the truth is not with the former Dahib, and you're saying the truth is with Sufyan Athori, for example, the truth according to you is with Sufyan Athori. Malik believed he had the truth. Shafi'i believed he had the truth. Hmm. So why can't we say that the truth is with them? You're just wrong. Sufyan Athori is wrong. Why do we have to follow you and say, you? yeah, you say Sufyan Athori was right in this issue and the other four is wrong. And yes, you're I, I, I'm saying. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? It's so subjective. It's no, like yes, everyone believes they're on the yeah, truth. Yeah, okay, you're right. I, I, you're, you're partially right on some on. what you're saying. You're right on the sense where I could say Sufyan Athori got this right. And the truth may have may be that the other four Imams are right. Mm. Okay. You, you're Which means right. it stays within the four. The truth is with, maybe. But to say that the haq is restricted to these four is what our discussion is about. It's okay. not whether Sufyan Athori is right here or wrong. He could be wrong. But if he is wrong, then the haq is with the four. No debate. I'm not discussing that with you. Huh. I'm discussing to say that every time these four imams agree on something, all four of them, then that means that's the haq. That's what your statement is giving. Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 yeah. that, that it's far, That's wrong. Why? Because we were commanded to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah says, "It will be unzil ilaykum min Rabbikum wa la tabi'u min duni awliya." You said ijma. It's only four people. How can four great imams, greater than you, greater than the modern day scholars like Sheikh Al Bani, Sheikh Salaf Fazan, how can four imams agree on an error? This is this is exactly the reason why Ibn Taymiyyah was actually imprisoned. And the whole issue with Ibn Taymiyyah took place. Okay, go on. They say Ibn Taymiyyah has 17 issues. 17 issues Ibn Taymiyyah khalaf al ijma You hear that? It's common. It's documented. Subhi and others mention that. Why? Because you want to get to four, four madhabs. But does that show the Ibn issue Taymiyyah is wrong? No, the truth is, actually, now the, the four madhabs today believe, all four madhabs believe, 
the issue of the talaq is it considered one or three? All madhabs are four. They all have one view on this issue. Which is what the one? Of If a man divorces a woman, yeah, um, and he gives talaq to her, he says three. Uh, three times at the same time in the same yeah if the man says to the woman i divorce you by three okay the four madhabs they believe that that talaq is considered to be the three that happened the four <laughs> not understanding it the four madhabs believe that if the man says i divorce you three times in a row yeah they believe that that is a proper divorce no they believe it's three divorces. they believe it's three divorces it's okay done. all four madhabs believe that okay do you mean <sighs> Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah believes yeah. it's only one. Okay, why? That is what it comes down to. Bigaddi another of who's right, who's wrong. No, that is an important part. Because if they're right and he's wrong, then you haven't proven to no, me. No, no, I'm not saying it's, it's right or wrong. I'm not trying to say it. I'm just trying to show to you that no, Ibn Taymiyyah did not see that argument to be valid. Yeah, and he can be, ro- he can be wrong and the former Dahib can still be right and the truth is But still the former Dahibs, again, if I, I, if I go into the discussion of where the fiqh issue is, It's based on the hadith in an Imam Muslims in Sahih in Hadith Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, where the time of the messenger yeah. and the time of Abu Bakr and two years of the time of Umar, the three divorces were considered one. If a man says to his wife, Anta tariqun thalath, and if he said three times, it was considered one. Okay. Umar then changed it. Radiallahu ta'ala and he said to the people, have a haste and a matter that was easy for them. And the people were just saying it. So he brought three is three. How did that knowledge come to you and miss these four noble great imams? What evidence did they have? Did they just make their no, I mean, I'm not like? saying they don't, they don't have evidence. Exactly. This is not the issue I'm coming to. The, oh. and I, they could be right and Ibn Taybi could be wrong. I, I have an opinion on this issue, but it's not what I want to go into. The okay. point, I don't want to do tarjih of who's right, who's wrong. Let's compare the two opinions. That's not what I do. I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say to you is we have Ibn, the four imams on one side. Yeah. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala is going against those four imams. No and they accuse Ibn Taymiyyah of being a person who went against the ijma'ah. And the ijma'ah they're referring to is these four imams. Okay, yeah. Now, this opinion now, by the way, of Ibn Taymiyyah, which he got in prison for, and it was an issue. I won't take it light. It became a big issue on him. Right. Very big issue. They saw it as to be heresy what he came with. Rahimahullah ta'ala Became now The most common opinion Amongst the majority Of the people You even go to Different countries Of Even people Who follow madhabs They started to give it A fatwa Yeah and, and numbers Are Ibn not Taymiyyah. a proof Numbers are not a proof for I, I'm not saying it's, It is a proof But what I'm trying To say to you Is my argument Is, is that The truth Cannot be restricted To individuals mm. That's okay. my argument You're saying That these individuals It could happen that Every at the start. time It could happen. I'm just saying yeah, hypothetically yeah, okay, that see. when these four imams agree with each other, we've not yet seen a mistake that came from them. That, that could even be an argument. I, I'm not going to discuss that. Yeah. But I'm just saying to you, that still doesn't make it because the, if these four agreed or something, it becomes a proof. Everybody if has that, to follow. If that's the case, then why can't someone say it is a proof because al istiqla? There could be one time if somebody can prove you otherwise. And it breaks. The, the premise of saying that these the haq is restricted to these four is wrong. Right. It's wrong. Okay, and you're building that premise on the uh, introduction that you said, which we both agreed on, that an individual can be right and can be wrong unless mm. he's a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these individuals, there's one, two, three, four of them, they could be right, they could be wrong. Because there could be a circumstance where he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. Okay, that is, you know, even regardless of whether we prove it with a mas'ala or not, that is a fair And point. that was something we said, isma, yeah. inf- to be infallible, Is for prophets. Hadith Abdullah ibn Hadith Amr ibn As in Sahih al Bukhari al Muslim. Mutafaq ala Ali. The Prophet said, "Ida hakam al Hakim ufajtaad, thumma asaba falahu ajran. Wa ida hakam ufajtaad, thumma akta falahu ajran." The Prophet told the scholars are between one reward or two rewards. They get it right, they get two rewards. They get it wrong, they get one reward. Which proves that they can get it wrong just from his statement. Yeah. Okay. And the only one, the only person who can come into that discussion and say no, they, the truth is within four, is if they bring in ijma. And you're saying that ijma was bought, but it wasn't correct because there's an ijma on the other side as well. Okay, let's put that to the discussion to the, to the side. I want to talk about another issue now. Again, this is part of the crux of the issue. You're following a madhab, or I say I'm following a madhab, for example, and I have a sahih hadith in Bukhari, for example, and I agree this hadith is authentic. Hmm. Am I now going to leave the madhab and follow the hadith? It depends on the person again. Okay. A Ammi cannot go to the hadith himself and extract rulings yeah. from it because he doesn't know how to use it. 
So again, his job is to go to the alim, a scholar, and okay. take what the scholar says. Okay. The muttabi'ah, the person who has ittiba, who can look at the madahibs, check the evidences, he's not allowed to. Again, he's not able to the, go to the Quran and the Sunnah himself. Mm. I mean, I cannot personally right now open the Quran, extract a ruling, بغض النظر of who said it. The Mujtahid mm. can do that. The Mujtahid will look at the Quran and the Sunnah, he'll bring out a ruling. He doesn't care who said it or who did it. Okay. He's looking at the Quran and the Sunnah based on the principles that were written on usul and qawaid, extract rulings out of it. He doesn't have to worry about who said it, who did, who agreed with him or not. He's got his evidences. He's mujtahid. He has that right. He's got the ala to which is present for him. The individual who's not reached that, he's a muttabi'ah. Hmm. He has to get the ayah and the hadith and support it with the understanding of a great imam. So when he brings the hadith to us, we say, okay, Jamil, the hadith is in Bukhari, we agree with you. Like who, who understood it like that? Mm. Even he can't just take the hadith and apply it himself without someone preceding him. If he's not a mujtahid, no. Okay. If he's a mujtahid, though. Yeah, then he can. Of course he can. Yeah, he has the right to. But if he's not a mujtahid, no. We'll say to him, how, you, you only read Bukhari in English. How can you just quote Bukhari like that to me? You don't understand it. Yeah. You don't know how Bukhari works. You don't, you could, this could be a general ruling. It could be a'am, and it could be a khas on the other on the other's part. Yeah. There could be a, this could be mansukh and there could be a nasikh. You don't you we don't know that. There could be a mutlaq and this become muqayyad. Yeah. The 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 dalil that you're using is a mafhum. And some qawa' mafhum is not a hujja. Mantuq is the strongest hujja. Mm. And we have a mu'aradha, a position between a mafhum and a mantuq. We're gonna give precedence to the mafhum. Uh, sorry, the mantuk over the mafum. And just explain these terms in English. Like we have a direct instruction from the Prophet, and then we have an understanding, a reverse understanding from the statement of the Prophet. Which one can take his precedence? Right. We take the direct one. If there's a contra- if there seems to be a contradiction between okay. the two. So what I mean is that a, a beginner student of knowledge can't come up with his own opinions. Every time he says something, he's asked, where do, who understood it like that? Who understood the daily like that? Yeah. A lot of people have an issue with this because they say, you admitted at the start that nobody has memorized all of the hadith. So say you have someone who's preceded you even, and say you are a mutabi', you're a follower, and you come across a sahih hadith, and you even have precedence that this hadith is applied into this situation. But how do you know there isn't another authentic hadith on the other side that is actually contradicting you because you admit yourself you, you don't know what What do you mean uh, on the other side? So for example, you have a mas'ala with two Evidence. views. Mm. Two views mm. You're following this view Because of a hadith That is authentic And you've seen it And you have someone Who's preceded you And said this applies here How do you know That this guy Who's following other Also doesn't have a hadith That may be abrogating This hadith Maybe it's stronger yeah, But I don't come to my conclusion Unless I read What's for me and against me But you, you just admitted You can't view all the hadith You don't know all the Who? hadith You uh, So but there's an opposition that's, that's there right Yes I mean, again, I'm not on much to find. All Are you going to read all of the evidences? I'm going to read. You? Yeah, I'm going to read each party's argument. Okay. That they brought to the table, and uh, and I'm not restricting the, the the people I look at. I'm not restricting them to the four metabs, as I said, because mm. the truth is not restricted only to the four. Okay. But when I read, this is where I, my tamadhub comes into place. Go on. Because you might think, okay, whoa, you're not even following any madhab. You're just looking at the dalil and the aqwal. Yeah. With that said, though. If I then look at the four, two argumentations that are going on, so it's an Imam Malik, and we have an Imam al Shafi'i arguing, going at each other on this issue, and the madhabs are very tough on this issue. By default, I'm looking at the Nusuls, the evidence that both parties are bringing, and how they're extrapolating a ruling from it. Yeah. When I look, I follow the arguments. Ani, I look at the Mujizun, those who are permitting it, and the Mani'un, those who are rejecting it. I go back and forth. It's a dialogue and a discussion back and forth. Hey, what did you say? What's your evidence? Hey, what's your evidence? You're, you're, you're looking okay. at all of that. Once you finish what each, you cross check all, then it might come to an argument of Tasheeh and al Hadith. Okay. Then you say, I'm going to grade the Hadith. Look, let me look at the Hadith. I'm going to look at who gra- the scholars who authenticated it. You go there. You might come back after a month and say, I believe now. Yani Malik is stronger than Shafi'i And I'm on with Shafi'i Malik on this issue Okay Now pay attention to that It may happen that I look at Malik and Shafi'i Going at each other on this issue And it does I can't seem to see who's right One time when I look at this one is right One time when I look at it from this right point of view is right It's really confusing me And I'm not able to take in who's right and who's wrong I can't put my finger on it 
This is where Tamat will comes for me. I say, look, I'll just stick to Shafi'i's view because that's the madhab I follow. And for the reasons you explained earlier Yeah, as well. now I come to the concept. I'm in this issue of muqallid. I And I won't impose it on anybody. I won't even argue with somebody. You're right, I'm wrong. I wouldn't. So a muqallid can't do that? A muqallid cannot argue. He takes a position based yeah. on blind following. He cannot yeah. say, you're wrong, you're no, right. No, he can't do tarjah. And he also can't say, uh-huh. uh, what was the second thing you said? You're wrong, you're right. You also said... Um, I forgot what this is. He can't thing. strengthen a view over uh, another view yeah. and say you're right or wrong. Yeah. And he can't impose it. He can't impose it. it. Yeah, yeah. He okay. can't impose it on other people, what he follows. Okay. I've now chosen to blind follow Shafi in this issue. I'm just sack it. I take it. Yeah. I'm quiet and I go on. If someone comes up to me, mashallah, who shows me how there's a mistake here and he brings strong evidence and explains it to me and he shows it to me, I'll follow the truth that he comes with. Yeah. And I now know why. My view is wrong. Do you not have an issue with, like you set a premise at the start that we follow the Quran and the Sunnah mm-hmm. and the only one who's infallible is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do you not have an issue that you're always following men? And I'll t- tell you what I mean by that. The way that you say this hadith is sahih, therefore it goes against this madhab and I'm going to take the authentic hadith. Who created authentic? Bukhari, Sheikh Al-Bani. These are men who are fallible and infallible. Mm, yeah. You're always following men either way. But we're not following the men. We're, look, we're following a science that is placed. Do you see it's a framework that's written? Go into that a bit more. So when I look at these ulama, I said to you before, we have furu' al-fiqiyya they have. Yeah. Rulings, halal and haram is furu' al-fiqiyya. When they say this is permissible, this is not permissible. This is furu' al-fiqiyya. This is what we read in the matin books. These are the conditions of salah. These are this. This is built upon an usul. Hmm. They just randomly throw that into the book. Okay. That the shurud of salah is this. It's built on a foundation for them. Okay, you with me? Yep. The usul, Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, when he was asked, he said, are you hanbali? He goes, la, where usul, our usul is the usul of Imam Muhammad. <laughs> he didn't say, our furu' fiqiyah, everything is Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Yeah. But that, like, Ibn Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, he would go against the madhab in many issues. Yeah. Hadith, riwayat, sanit, yani, Shaykh ibn Hanbal was alim in hadith. Alim in hadith. Many people undermine Shaykh ibn Baz when it comes to hadith. Really? Shaykh ibn Baz, yes, Shaykh ibn Baz is not, he's not, young, he's not less than Shaykh ibn Albani in hadith. No. Well, no, he's not little. I mean, Sheikh Abu Baz, alayhi rahmatullah, was a alim in hadith. Really? Yeah. Abdul Rahman Yahya al Muallimi quoted Sheikh Abu Ibn Baz. Muallimi quoted Sheikh Abu Baz. And there was a debate that happened between the two of them. Anyways, the point is. Sorry, yeah. And that's not how the Mamlaka is now. The Mamlaka, Saudi Arabia now, is drifting towards this hardcore tamadhub of Hanbali Madhab. It's changing it's, and he's tricking it into a way. That we never used to be before the time of Sheikh Ibn Baz and the time of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin and others changing now. There's this wave of tamadhub, jumud, and ta'asub is starting to happen. We're starting to see that. Anyways, Sheikh Ibn Baz was asked, Are you Hanbali? He said, Our usul is the usul of the Hanabila. Like if the furu' al fiqiyah, we might go against the madhab in issues of furu' al fiqiyah. And that's exactly what I'm saying to you. I believe that I'm of the usul of the Imam. And Imam uh, Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. Like it's sometimes some furu' fiqiyah, the dalil is wadah, sarih. It's crystal clear that Shafi'i might, might, might have gone against this issue. And Shafi'i was the one who said to me, what? Ida sahal hadithu fawah madhabi. If the hadith is sahih, so I follow the statement of Imam Shafi'i by doing what? If something's wrong? By leaving his madhab. Yeah, by leaving. Yeah. He told me to do yeah, that. He told you. And he told you that's my madhab. Yeah. إذا صح الحديث yes, yeah, yeah. فهو مذهبي. So you're more of a follower of his madhab. I'm more of a follower of Imam Shafi'i okay. when I follow the authentic hadiths. Okay. So, um, coming back to what you mentioned, the student of knowledge, when he reads the discussion between scholars, he's not following their statements necessarily. He's following the principles that are there. For example, there's qa'idah, which is, is there, if there's a general text and there's a specific text, the specific is given precedence to the general. That's what, that's a principle now. Hmm. Now we have Shafi'i using a general text. We have Imam Malik using a specific text. Who am I going to give the up hand to? The specific As I'm text. watching the dialogue going between the two. Yeah. This is what, who's following the framework? Who's it? I'm seeing Shafi'i using, for example, an uh, abrogated text. Hmm. Who's given precedence? The one that's Imam abrogating, Malik. right? Yeah. That, so that's how the discussion goes. Okay. I'm not following them as individuals. I'm following who is in line with the qawaid okay who is in line with the quran and the sunnah in this issue a lot of a lot of people actually bring a, a contention here and they say that this asr that you have 
that if the hadith is sahih, I'm going to follow it, is a problem in the first place. How? I'll give you an example. Let's take, let's let's bring a real life example, like this mas'ala of the taslim at the end of the salah. Imam Shafi'i has a sahih hadith on his side that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did it twice, so one shoulder, one shoulder. Imam Malik believes that hadith is sahih, but he said all of the people of Medina only did it once. Now you have an issue where you have a sahih hadith and you're saying, I'm going to follow this. But the problem you have is that this is not how it was implemented by the people who saw the companions, who saw the Prophet ﷺ pray. And the Prophet ﷺ said, pray as you see me pray. Mm -hmm. He did not say, pray as you read in my hadiths. Therefore, this issue of Ahlul Medina and their actions, and if all of the people of Medina did this, that has to take precedence over a sahih hadith that you're reading 1,400 years later. It has to. Okay. Now you've come to one of the evidences that are disputed. The evidence are two types. There's a dalil which is mujma'un ali. All the scholars from Imam Abu Hanifa to Imam Ahmed to every Muslim we all agreed upon, which is Al-Quran. Okay. Was-Sunnah. Wal-Ijma'a. Wal-Qiyas sahih Okay. This is agreed upon. Okay. The other than Zahiri on the issue of Qiyas, the Quran, Sunnah, the Ijma'a and the Qiyas sahih The Qiyas is done properly, it's agreed upon. These four are adilla mujma'a. Adilla evidence which are agreed upon. There are now evidences which are not necessarily agreed upon. For example, is Madhab Ahl al Medina. Right. It's, min, it's from the Adila which is Muhtalafu fi. Imam Malik believes it, but not. Imam Malik, not. we don't all agree. We don't, we don't, take, we don't follow them. Fair. The second one is Al Istishab Bika Makan Ala Makan. The concept of default. The default is this, so it's an evidence. You have to go. It's a, it's a Dalil which is Muhtalafu fi. Hmm. Also, Sadd al Dara'iyah is Adila which is Muhtalafu fi. Yani, prohibiting something because of the means that's. Prohibiting the means because of what it's going to lead to. Mm -hmm. It's a, a dalil which is muhtalif um, Allah shara'u man qablana. The legislation of the people who came before us, if it doesn't go against our Quran and Sunnah, we don't have texts that are affirming it or rejecting mm -hmm. it. What do we do with those things mm -hmm. that we find from the scriptures of the previous nations? We, by, by the way, in our Sharia, there's nothing rejecting this concept. And there's nothing in our Sharia that's also affirming it. Okay. But it's present in the early generation, uh, early nations. Can we take it as proof? Which is the concept of um, all of those I mentioned are a dilla which is muhtalifu fi. Meaning they're differed, differed upon. Differed upon aslan, yeah. if we can even take it. So my discussion with you is madhabu ahli al-Madina, is it hujjah or is it not, is the discussion. Right. And that's why I came to you at the beginning and I said to you, istidlal al usul al fiqh, what's it called? Usul al istidlal al fiqh, the foundation in which they built to extract their fiqh from is different amongst themselves. Don't, don't you think that's a bit contradictory with the other statements like I follow the Salaf, Khairun Nasi Qawni, Thumma Ladini Lunahum, etc. And these, the Ahlul Medina were the people who saw the companions, who saw the Restricting. Prophet. In Medina where the, where the Prophet died. But everybody left when uh, Medina. Sahabas just scattered and they went to other parts of the world. And you know, Abdullah Mas'ud moved and went to Kufa. The point I'm trying to come to is restricting the truth to a people is like restricting the truth to a land. Okay. Just the same way I said to you, the four madhabs, we cannot restrict the truth to only them. Okay. We can't restrict the truth to only a buqa, a land. But these are the, this is the land where the Prophet died just a few everybody, decades earlier. After the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, and we're talking about an Imam Umari came. Decades, centuries after the Prophet Century. No, okay, he died once. When did he die? One seventy nine Hijriah. Yeah. When was he born? Ninety three. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died ten years into the Hijri calendar. Mm -hmm. So you've not really got a lot of long time between him and Imam Malik. And the people of Medina at that time, you're saying that they went so far astray that they forgot how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even prayed. You can't count an Imam Malik's life when he was born. Okay. And Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala was born in the 93rd year of the Hijriah. Mm -hmm. That's nearly 100 years uh -huh. from the time of the Prophet sallallahu his Hijrah. You know how many Imams and how yani Malik never met any companion. Mm. He never met any of the companions. So the point I'm trying to say to you is that the madhab to build it on Ahlul Medina. Even if Ahlul Medina are all doing the same action. As far as Malik can say, so I saw all of the people of Medina. No, we can't say all of the Ahlul Medina were doing it because that's according to his knowledge of who he saw. So when he says... He must have seen a lot of people in his lifetime. He did. He met, he's, he met a lot of great scholars. But that's again what he built his argument on. And that's why many scholars didn't all agree with him on this issue. Madhab mm -hmm. Ahlul Medina. 
and he he didn't reject hadiths based on it. He restricted the meaning of the hadith. I heard that he would take the Ahlul Medina as the, the level of mutawatir hadith. So no, if he has a had hadith, he would choose the Ahlul Medina over that. The, again, sometimes issues of attributions to the madahibs are a bit hard, far-fetched. It's views that mutakhirin held. So why do you, the issue I want you to understand is that mm. the whole issue of tamadhub is building your rulings on the usul of the imam. And the followers of that madhab will differ upon the ruling because of how they saw the usul of the imam was on this issue. The followers of the madhab would differ upon the ruling because of how they perceive the usul of the madhab, the same madhab. Yeah. And you have ikhtilaf within the madhab. Of course we do. Hmm. We will have it. No, we has a qawl, Rafi has a qawl. And we have ashabul wujuh. Within the madhahib, there's ashabul wujuh. People who can extract those rulings. Not everybody can do it. The point I'm trying to say to you is that you're using now a delil which is disputed, Aslan. The foundation of that evidence is deli- de- disputed. And on your side, you have a delil which is not disputed. Uh, so the sunnah, essentially. Yeah. Okay, fine. I want to take you back to the muqallid because I do believe that a lot of people who will be watching this will fall into that. First question I have is, you mentioned about yourself now that you would consider yourself to be a muttabi' in certain issues, but then you might become a muqallid in another issue. Are you allowed to move between these darajah, between these kind of levels? For example, I'm a muqallid in an issue, but in this one other issue, I believe I've got a bit of research with me, I can become a muttabi'. Yeah, permissible? a mujtaid sometimes might be a mujtaid in something, but a muqallid in another thing. From there to there? Yeah, it could be, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, okay. It could be a mas'ala, he's a muqallid in that mas'ala. Okay. And in another mas'ala, he's a mujtaid. It's not always the case that he's a mujtaid over the board. Hmm. There's some issues he just blind follows. No. Okay, so this person, he's going to blind follow. A lot of people also ask the question, you said you're not allowed to blind follow one person. The argument I'm going to put forward for you is that this is what happened at the time of the Prophet The Prophet many times mentioned this companion is the most knowledgeable in this science. This companion is the most knowledgeable in this science. I take this science from this companion alone. Another example. No, no, that's your. That's from your own pocket. Okay, this is what people say. Yeah. Another example. No, but that's that's ziyada you added onto the narration. Mm. The Prophet like, we're not denying that Al Imam Abu, Abu Hanifa is a alim, and he's the most knowledgeable. He's knowledgeable than all of us. Yeah. Al Imam Malik Rahimullah is an alim. He's more knowledgeable than what we know. He's more knowledge of the uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and all of them. We know Al Imam Shafi'i the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more knowledgeable than every any and everybody that we know, like all the ulama that we've seen or we met or we read about. These scholars are more knowledgeable. Ahmed Sayyid, rahimahullah ta'ala. We're not denying that these are ulama, ulama, jahabida, these are fuqaha, these are yani, mujtahideen, mujtahideen. This is, what, this is what they are. That being said, I don't have to follow every single thing that this one imam says. Everything of his statement I follow. Ibn al Qayyim says in his Ilam al Muqi'in, he says, Wala yalzamu ahadan qattun an yatamadhaba bi madhabi rajulin min al umma, behaitu yakhudu akwalahu kulluha, wa yadau akwala gayrihi, wa hadi bidatun kabihatun haddatat fil umma. Ibn al Qayyim he says, It is not upon a person to follow a madhab and he takes the whole entire view of that imam. I'm only going to take what an imam man mm-hmm. he said. And I believe the haq is restricted to the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i. I don't believe that. But you're not following one imam. Yeah. Sorry, I want you to finish the I'm not saying that I'm, I'm blind following. You, whether even be a, yani the madrasa of Imam al-Shafi'i. Yeah, the madhab has been refined, it's been reformed, it's been changed. You've got, you got centuries of people, the that, greatest Islamic minds in history have come and you're following this. You're but following then you many. can't say the truth. I just said to you the truth is not restricted in the four madhabs. Hmm. You're now telling me the truth is restricted in one madhab through its time. I'm, how am I going to accept that? I've rejected all four of them added together. It doesn't matter if the truth is not restricted to them. Why can't someone follow them? You might say because they're going to follow something that's false. But so are you. When you're no, I'm re- saying to you, following the madhab, yeah. in every single statement of it, without seeing anything wrong with it. Hadi bid'atun qabiha. Which means? It's a evil innovation has introduced. So when the Prophet sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal to Yemen, mm. who were they following apart from Mu'ad? What, what do you mean like? The people of Yemen. Okay. They had Mu'ad with him, with them. Ta'ala who were they following in terms of Tawheed, Salah even? Who were they following other than him? Uh, but, okay. Pe- That's pe- prophetic sunnah. Okay, beautiful. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, only just send Mu'ad. 
Really? Who else is Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and other people? At the same time? Yeah, he sent it at the time. The Prophet said, Yassira wa la tu'ashira. Bashira wa la tunafira. Also, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him exactly what to command them. Say this to them. Say this to them. Say this to them. Mu'adh was not bringing his own legislation, his understanding from anything. He was conveying a message that was passed on to him. And do the historians say how long he was there for? Um, Any idea, roughly? The Prophet passed away and he was still there. Yeah, so how can you say he's not bringing anything of his own interpretation for the many years? I'm not saying The he, Prophet couldn't tell him I'm to not, say this I'm, every I'm, single day I'm, and then this next I'm, week and then this... I'm saying the Prophet told him to convey a message. Yeah. And he told him exactly what to say. He said to him, Ya Mu'adh, if they obey this it, on you, he said, say this to them. Why the did narration, it years to say those two things? The narration, yeah. the narration, uh, Mu'adh is conveying what he saw. He saw the Prophet put his hand up here. He's going to say, people, I saw the Prophet put his hand up Imam Malik is conveying what he saw. No, he didn't see Medina. the Prophet. No, no, he didn't see it from the Prophet. That's my point. From the people of Medina, now we're talking about is it authentically transmitted mm. from the, is there a change, is his understanding of this hadith right? Is It's different. The other point I want you to understand here is, is that Malik is an alim, Shafi'i is an alim, Ahmad is an alim, all of these great scholars are alim. Lakin, taking every single statement that Shafi'i says, me taking the st entire statement Ahmad says, yani all of that, Ahmad didn't even want me to do that, Rahimahullah ta'ala. So I told you this is a bid'atun qabihatun hadithat fil ummah. Look what each Ibn, Ibn al Qayyim says. He says, Lam yaqul biha ahadun min a'immati al-Islam. No scholar has ever said, this Imam follow everything he says. Ibn al Qayyim is saying, Wahum a'la rutbatan wa ajallu qadaran wa a'lamu billahi wa rasulihim an yulzimu al-nasa bidhalik. The scholars are يعني, high in knowledge and understanding of Allah's prophets and the religion of Islam and they know Allah greatly to then force people to follow one Imam, everything he says. وَأَبْعَدُ مِنْهُ What even makes it even worse and far-fetched is مَنْ قَالَ يَلْزَمُهُ أَنْ يَتَمَذْهَبَ بِمَذْهَبِ عَالِمٍ مِنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ To say you have to do tamadhub of just one madhab. وَأَبْعَدُ مِنْهُ قَوْلُ مَنْ قَالَ يَلْزَمُهُ أَنْ يَتَمَذْهَبَ بِأَحَدِ الْمَذَاهِبِ الْأَرْبَعَةِ Ibn al-Qaim is amazed to say that you have to follow one of the four. Ibn al-Qaim, this is said far-fetched. فَيَا لِلَّهِ الْعَجَبُ Fascination is to Allah. The companions, madahibs, has passed away. وَمَذَاهِبُ التَّابِعِينَ وَتَابِعِيهِمْ وَسَائِرُ عَيْمَةِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَبَطَلَ الْجُمْلَةً إِلَّا مَذَاهِبُ أَرْبَعَةِ أَنفُسٍ فَقَطْ The madhabs of all of the sahabas died. And the madahibs of all the tabi'een are gone. And it's only, the haq is only now restricted to four. Ibn al-Qayyim is saying. مِنْ سَائِرِ عَيْمَةِ وَالْفُقَهَا From all of the other fuqaha, Layth ibn Sa'ad, Abu Thawr, Ibn Jarir has a madhab. All of the a'imma is haq ibn Rahu, he has a madhab and he's yani fiqh, yani all of those gone. Haba' ibn Thura. What's left? Just these four? وَهَلْ قَالَ ذَلِكَ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْأَيْمَةِ Has anyone ever from the early, bring, bring me people early who said this? Oh, da'a ilayhi, oh, call the people to this. Oh, dallat alayhi lafzatun wahidatun min kalamihi alayhi. Or even his statement shows that the haq is restricted to these four. That's not, that's not correct. Tamadhub, the basic argument for tamadhub is that it's permissible. Okay. There are three views when it comes to tamadhub. The first view is batil, awham min bayt al-ankabut, which says that it's wajib to follow madhab. And you're a sinner if you don't follow it. That's the first view. And I told you, a group of scholars, they said, you have to follow a madhab. وَجَائِزٌ تَقْلِيدُ غَيْرِ الْأَرْبَعَ لِذِي ضَرُورَةٍ وَفِي هَذَا السَّعَةٍ You can follow the, you follow the four madhabs. And you can only go outside it when there's a necessity. Hawithi billah. That's wrong. Abu Amr ibn Salah held that opinion. Abu Al-Faraj ibn Rajab al-Hanbali also strengthened that opinion. It's wrong. And Nafarawi in Sharh al-Risala, and also Maraq, Sahib al-Maraqi, he says that it's ijma' hmm. وَالْمُجْمَعُ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْهِ أَرْبَعَةِ وَقَفُ غَيْرِهَا الْجَمِيعُ مَنَعَةِ And this is the view of the, this ijma' by the way, it's the ijma' of the mutakhirin. As the early Muhammad al-Alama, Muhammad al-Amin al The second opinion is that it's mubah. You want to follow the four madhab? It's mubah. This is the view of al-Qadi Iyad, Ibn Khubayra, Ibn Farhun. It's permissible. But, but within that, someone following one madhab only in all of its issues? No. You you think it's not mubah. No, you can't. I think it's important to clarify. And the third view is al-man'u. You're not allowed to at all follow madhab. Ibn Hazm is the, is the madhab al zahiriya and Ibn Hazm clearly says that he's not allowed to follow a madhab. Which we're going to discuss in the... Yeah, I believe you can follow a madhab as yeah. it's just a means. 
lacking, restricting yourself. By the way, I already told you, told you the only person who's allowed to follow Madhab is a talib of ilm, a student of knowledge who studied usul al-fiqh. Like in the, the one who doesn't know anything, yeah, he go to your sheikh, ask him what he tells you. Don't even talk about this issue of tamadhub and you know this is madhab, this is madhab. You're miskin, you can't speak Arabic. You majority of the people fall under that. Yeah, of course. Well, speaking yeah. for madhab, madhab, madhab. Yeah, yeah. You they see. should have no madhab. No, they just they ask the imam. Uh, whatever he says, they follow him. Al-ami ula madhab alaw. Ami has no madhab. He goes, he doesn't even talk about the madhab. He's way below the concept of madhab. Mm. He goes and he asks his sheikh, and whatever his sheikh tells him, he does it. He trusts. He follows that. The talib al ilm that studied usul al fiqh. When it comes to the fiqh, kutub al fiqh, he's meant to understand the dialogue that's going on. Right. Okay. But even him as an individual, he's not safe from his desires. Oh. And this, the, the talib al ilm, the, the one who's ah. in the, the middle part, ah. he's not safe from his desires. Sahih. Now you're opening up a door for him to follow his desires because you're saying you can choose from the different opinions and maybe this one's a bit easier for me, for example. So let me lean towards this one. Mm. You've Tatabra opened that door for him. Yeah. Him following the Rukhas. Yeah. You see, the evidence is what I told you he needs to follow. I didn't tell you he follows the Shawad al Akwal, strange opinions. The student of knowledge, when he's a Muqallid, hmm. for example, there are stages and steps that he can take. For example, I told you before that I take the call of Imam Shafi'i when an issue doesn't become clear to me. Lakin, if the Jumhurul Ulama, the overwhelming majority of scholars are on one side and Shafi'i is alone on that issue, I will walk away from it. Because you, I believe the Jumhur is, is a number now. I, I can't clarify the issue. So I'll go to the Jumhur. It's a safer for me than taking an opinion straight held by Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. Based on numbers? On this situation right now. Yeah. The evidence is not clear to me. Okay. Each party is using solid arguments. But the jumhur, the overwhelming majority of scholars, I'm muqallid now. Hmm. I'm just going to follow the majority on this issue. Step taken, but follow it. And I'm going to adhere. I'm not going to impose anybody. I'm not going to have a dialogue about it. I'm not going to go out there and tell people this is right, this is wrong. Because I'm just a muqallid. I just follow the call of the jumhur. I just call al jumhur. Okay. I won't give fatwa on it because I'm not allowed to. I'm a muqallid. I'm a blind follower. Fine. Um, now, coming back to the issue of, um, yeah, what was your question? Following your desires because you've left the open. Yeah, following your Let's desires on an issue. I told you, you, don't, you, don't, you follow a, the, the delil. Yeah. The delil that you follow. So, for example, when you take an opinion of an alim, first of all, the delil is the number one. For mutabir, a person who's following yeah. the unity back. He asks every alim, what's your delil? Good, put your delil here for me. I hear, Malik, what's your delil? Put it here for me. Ahmed, what's your delil? Rahimahullah ta'ala, what's your delil? Put it here. Abu Hanif, what's your delil? He puts it here. All four of their evidence, he puts it here. Then he asks each one, what's, he, what's your understanding from this text? Mm -hmm. he, he brought up a valid point. What about you? What do you think? That's the discussion that's happening here. Yeah. And the teacher comes out. The talib here can do that. He's okay. strong enough to read. He's read good books of usul al-fiqh. Studied up to Kutub al-Maraq al-Su'ud and Lubb al-Usul and Jab'u al-Jawami. And he studied books of usul. He's able to do that. He won't fall into, inshallah ta'ala, follow Rukhsa. Because the one who's following Rukhsa does not look at the evidences. He looks for a strange opinion and he says, give it to me. I want it. He puts it in his pocket. He then goes to another strange opinion over there. He said, give it to me. And he puts it in his pocket. He, goes, he looks for the opinion. He doesn't look at who said it, what their evidences are, what they used it for. He doesn't. He collects all of those views and uh, a madhab comes out for him. Yeah. yeah he there he creates his own madhab. Yeah. That madhab doesn't exist. Hmm. Because each one, you might have an imam for it. But when this whole entire thing came together, what madhab is this? It's a new one. The scholars, they say, this person, and some scholars, they say, tazandaka, heresy, he fell into heresy. Some scholars, they say, man al anyone who follows the shawad al-masail, you know, all of evil will be combined in you. Because he's literally taking the strangest opinions. He's looking for the strangest yeah, opinions. Looking, so he just takes it from the... Yeah, and that's, that's present in the books if you okay, want to find but, it. But even, even then, because it's a big argument that the people who say it's wajib to follow one madhab only, even then, these people actually say that the fact that you've let this student of knowledge open the door to looking at the evidences, and ideally, in an ideal world, he will just look for the evidences, but you've opened this door for him to now choose between the madhahib. You've opened the door for him to follow his desires. And the best way to close the door is... 
stick to one method. But then you're now using an evidence known as Sadd al-Dara'ya, which is Adila Mukhtalifun fihi. You're stopping this because it's going to lead to this, right? Yeah, but you don't believe that uh, that is a, I mean, why do we not free mix? Because we don't want to lead to... No, that Sadd al-Dara'ya is clearly categorically So there stated. are there are the ones where there are, it's not disputed. No, the, but it's, that it's, no, I'm not saying, I'm saying is Sadd al-Dara'ya hmm. can be used when it's textually stated. Okay. This me the ria has been stated by the Sharia. Anything beyond that is your istimbat. You're using it. You're you're using it qiyas. as a qiyas, right? Yeah. So it's a dila muqtalafun fi. Qiyas is not. No, I'm saying saddu fi. No, I'm not saying qiyas is muqtalafun fi. Okay. I'm saying to saddu dharai is it's a dila by itself that's used. Okay. And that's what you're using now. Yeah. And if we're discussing it as usul and qawaid, that's a dila muqtalafun fi. It's a dispute that is differed upon. Put that aside for me. Hmm. Let's go back to the discussion of the person can follow the Quran clearly and categorically for an alim. And that's what many people do. They follow the goal of the alim as an understanding, but the delil is what they're following. So in other words, Malik gives a delil for this issue. Malik gives a delil? Yeah. And for example, the khisa of Ibn Abi Dhibin and Malik, the hadith al bayani Abil Khiyari. Malik claimed that hadith is mansukh. When we looked at it, it's not mansukh. So who's right here? Someone's right. Why can't they both be right? Why, why can't two opposites can't come together? They when can. It's saying it, we have the sunnah for that. Two this opposites. Yes. So, what do you know? What mansukh uh, is? <laughs> yeah, abrogated. Okay. Abrogated shows ma'mul ma ma'mul. Yeah. Acting upon it and can't be acted upon it. Okay. So the Prophet said when he sent the companions in the battle of Ahzab. No, just this one. How can we take both opinions? One is saying this hadith is abrogated. Mm. Hadith is gone. We can't act upon it. Another one saying, no, the hadith is muhkam. It's not abrogated. We can act upon it. They're two opposites. How can you bring their two views together? With the example of the Prophet ﷺ sending the companions on the battle of Ahzab, when he said, do not pray Salat al-Asr until you reach your destination. Ah. And the companions were on the journey mm. and Salat al-Asr time was coming in. Ah. And some of them thought, oh, I think we should pray now. But there's one, there now. was one view that was right. No, because they went back to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, you're both right. The Prophet ﷺ, and when they both came back to him, yes. he did not scold any one of them. Yes. He didn't tell them any, any one of them wrong. Okay. Both of them left with the rewards. One got two and one got right one. But who, which one was right? The one that was right was the one who prayed the salah when he came in. According the to salah who? is a legislation from Allah. But did the Prophet some say that at the time? You were wrong and you were right. Did no, he say that? that we, so we got, let's slowly, let's take this step. Go on. Let's take this point slowly. There's something called ijtihad. Okay. Meaning, which the scholars, when they look at it, all of the adilla are يعني, pull and push. It's not clear. Hmm. I mean, there are masail which are ijtihadiya. No one can like belittle the other person for holding it. For example, when we go down in the salah, do we put our knees down or our hands first? For example, it's a masail ijtihadiya. Ijtihad means both parties have solid evidences. The concept is how do we understand this? Hmm. And evidences are qabila, open for this and this. Hmm. Niqab is it wajib. It's open for this and that. Okay. I mean, there are many issues like that we, we see people discussing back and forth. Fine. It's open for all parties. Okay. People I'm make a big hoo ha about it, but it's really open for both parties. Yeah. The hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La yusalli anna ahadukum illa fi banu Quraidah. That none of you should pray except in banu Quraidah. Mm -hmm. And he said them, alayhi salatu salam. That hadith, the truth is only one. Don't ever think to yourself the truth can be two or three or four. It can't be truth. Both parties are now sitting down to understand from this hadith, what the Prophet meant. Yeah. A group of the, them stuck to the word. Okay. And a group of them took a mafhum from it, which is that the Prophet, when he said, don't pray, except in Banu Quraidah, he meant hasten. Get there fast. Make sure Asr reaches you in Banu Quraidah. Okay. So it was isti'jal, he was haste. Yani, the Prophet can't delay salah. He's not a musharri, he's not a legislator, alayhi salatu salam. Allah is the one who so the salah time is sanctioned, it sits. Hmm. When the Prophet said that he meant get there fast, okay. that party is correct. The party who understood it as to mean, you know, um, the Prophet told us not to pray even if the salah time comes in until we get to Banu Quraidah, their understanding was incorrect. But that being said, they got to that conclusion based on their ijtihad. Okay. I already told you the Prophet said, "Either, either hakam al hakimu 
فاجتهد فأصاب فله أجران وإذا حكم الحاكم فأخطأ فله أجر واحد Okay, let's break it down. The issue of praying salah on time, is that a mas'ala that is ijtihadiyah? Which one do you mean? Praying the salah on time. That's clear cut. There is no dispute on that. You have to pray your salah on time. Yeah, sorry, okay? Sorry. So that's not an ijtihadi issue. Okay. It becomes an ijtihadi issue because they have a statement from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which they're trying to implement at the same time. Correct. These companions at the time. Correct. That's my point with all of these madahib that you say, this one's wrong and this one's right and this one's right. They've all got delil on their side. No. They do. Not, so not all of it. So that's their right issue. The statement of the Prophet is a delil, they, right? Yeah, but they, there are issues. There are issues which are ijtihadiyah amongst the madahib. So you're right. I'm not going to deny that. Okay. There are issues which are ijtihadiyah. Masail which are ijtihadiyah. Yes. No, I'm not denying it. Okay. And it's it's how you look at it, to be honest. Yeah. But this, I still hold an opinion. And I'm willing to have a discussion with the other person. Okay. But when I get up from that discussion with that brother, who's a Hanafi, for example, and he believes that, and he's doing ijtihad, yani he's, the ijtihad of his madhab is on this, and my ijtihad on this issue is this, we get up and there's no hatred or animosity between us because it's a mas'ala ijtihad ya mahda. Like there are issues which are haq and batil, even if your imam said it. But, yeah. sh- but sh- okay. Some issues are haq. They're khilafiyya, but they're ijtihadiyya. Okay, I see. They're dis- they're, there's, there's a there's difference, differences, in, but it's not valid. There's a right or wrong. Okay. There's a what? There's a right or wrong. One is right and one is one is wrong. The issue of the wali, for example, the guardian of the woman, we say Abu Hanifa akhta is wrong. Mm. And he, he's going to leave with the reward. He's going to leave with the reward. And the Prophet said, anyone who follows him after the evidence comes to him is a sinner. When, did he, did when he, a source is read to you yeah. And the views Adilla is read on you You can't still stick to Imam Abu Hanifa It's not permissible for you now Because you have no source Click from the Quran And the Sunnah In which it says to you Here, here you can't say uh, Our madhab believes this Our view is this This is what ta- This is the ta'asub And Abu about. Hanifa never had any Quran and Sunnah on his side That's, I'm not saying he didn't He did it right On this I, issue I'm saying to you I'm saying to you Is that what your statement is going to allude to is that Imam Abu Hanifa, every single situation, this is their argument, and it's, this is what it implies Go that on. he can't do a mistake. That's what you're implying now. No, By saying, Imam, you're telling me this hadith, Imam Abu Hanifa didn't know? Yeah, that my, what I'm implying is that the madhab, the Imams of the madhab. I just said to you, the, Imam Abu Hanifa may, he's not memorized all the hadiths. Neither has Imam Shafi or Ahmed but or But they Malik. brought out a hadith that, Sha- or they brought out a delil. That Imam Abu Hanifa didn't. What if he knew about that delil, but he didn't accept it as a delil? Maybe it's a weak hadith to him. His own student, they said, Al Qadi Abu Yusuf. Yeah. They said in some of the words, he disagreed with him in all of the views that Imam Abu Hanifa held, except a handful of, I don't know the number. Okay. His own student. Yeah. Muhammad al Hassan al when he debated with Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, and he came to the conclusion of some issues and he t- repented from it or he took back some views, he said, Wallahi, if my sahib, Ya Ali Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa, was alive, Wallahi, he would have take, taken the opinion the way I took it. I'm taking it now. Hmm. My, it just comes back to my scholar said this, your scholar said that. Like, no, it's not. I'm it's, saying to you, the default position that many people are getting wrong is that they're looking at the scholar as though he's infallible from the big get go. It's the in implication. Are you open minded to accept? That Imam Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi and Ahmed can all do mistakes. First of all, do you accept okay. that? Okay. No, yes or no? Okay. Uh, I have to explain it. I have to explain the answer. No, I, for this simple, it's a question. It's a simple okay. question. Is Imam Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmed, are they infallible? We agree at the start that they're not infallible, so they are open to mistakes. We agree that at the start. Okay. Okay. So you're saying that Imam. Let's, let's, let's go through the process. So. Okay, so they're not, if they're not, they can do mistakes. They can do mistakes. Okay. So can, by the way. The scholars, Ibn, uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, Sheikh Al Albani, Sheikh Al Albani, everyone, yeah, all can. Of them. everyone Everybody can. can. Okay, Jimmy. Now it brings us to the argument then. Okay. We don't get offensive over the people anymore. Agreed. Now we, Let's get to the argument. Okay. Second point I come to you with this. Okay. Now that you've accepted that all of these ulama, yukhadu min qawlihi wa yurad, his statement can either be taken or rejected. Rejected. Alhamdulillah. Let's look at the arguments now. Okay. Who are you to say that this argument is wrong? I'm not going to. Uh, who is who is Ibn Taymiyyah? Who, 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 no, no, forget Ibn Taymiyyah. We're going to look at the four Imams themselves. Okay. Well, are you happy with the four Imams? Yeah, themselves? yeah. Let's ah, do that. Okay. Take the issue of Imam Abu Hanifa, where he came to the issue of the uh, uh, woman marrying herself off. Okay. Imam Abu Hanifa said, if a woman goes to a shop and she buys and she sells, 
would that tra transaction be accepted? I'm asking a question. Repeat the question. A, a woman goes and she goes to a shop. Yeah. She's buying and she's selling something. Yeah. She's got a watch. She's got something she wants to sell. Can she do it? What did Abu Hanifa say? I don't know. What no, I'm say. asking you. Yes, yeah, she can. Abu Hanifa said she can. Okay. She can. Yeah, which we, of course, a woman can buy and sell whenever okay. she wants. There's nothing wrong with that. Abu Hanifa said, if he, she can sell and she can buy things, why can't she give herself out? Okay. Okay. Does She's made Qiyas. He's then, he's which is yes. valid from Ijma, Quran, Sunnah, Ijma, Ijma right? Qiyas. Okay, beautiful, right? Okay, it's, it's valid. He's it's valid. He's got a Qiyas here. Beautiful. Okay, carry on. Okay, put that aside for me. Okay. We have the scholars here, on the other hand, bringing the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What if he says that hadith is weak? Now, let me, I'm, step by step, we're going okay, to go, go back and forth to the, each discussion. We're going to go back and forth. Who from now At this point Before we go into The authentication or We're going to come to that Who at this moment Is right As we're okay. discussing the issue Okay my question is No stop, stop. We're just, uh, just, I'm, I'm asking you a question I'm not answering the question Can they both be right No they can't Okay I want to no, I'm asking you a question yeah. Abu Hanifa used Qiyas Yes These scholars have used A hadith You haven't looked Into the gradient You're going to now Going to change your But at this moment Yeah Who's right? I can't say because if I look into the grade and I say this a week. No, you're going to change. We're going to change again. We're going to say Abu Hanifa came back and he responded. But well, let's you can't leave hadith unrestricted. No, I, look, I'm saying to you, one person used a hadith, and another person used a what? Yeah, qiyas. Qiyas. Yeah. The hadith you? could be fabricated. We. We're going to come to it as a second phase. <laughs> I'm, I want us to come to. It. I want to step <laughs> okay. by step. Okay. The scholars they say, this is what I'm trying to say to you. The scholars they say, let let jihad fi nas. There's no ijtihad when there's a nas. Okay. Abu Hanifa, Barakallahu fi you gave a qiyas. Fi mawridin nas. I'm a fi mawtinin nas. At a time when the nas is being provided. Ida ja'a nahrullahi ja'a ida ja'a nahrullahi batala nahru mi'aqal. If the ocean, yeah. Mi'aqal was a man who had a little well. Had a little well. He used to charge the people. He used to put the bucket in there for them. Get the water out. And he would give the water to the people. And he would charge them. Say, give me money. Mm. Maybe because he, little put a, he put a little a motor, an engine there to get the water out. Okay, so he charges the people. He's allowed to do that, right? So one day Allah sends down a rain. The rain, it gushes and everybody's now got water. Are they going to come to the water of uh, no, there's miracle? No need. There's no need. There's no need. Allah's river is there, right? Yes. Allah's had the hadith of the Prophet is here now. The goal of Imam Abu Hanifa now is gone. Finished. Abu Hanifa came back. This okay. is how we, we look at their discussion. Okay. Abu Hanifa came and said, hadith is life. Okay. We're yeah. going to be like to the party Sorry Abu Hanif is right You guys are without nothing And he's without nothing no, He hasn't got nothing He's got Qiyas he's got, he's got nothing The Qiyas is not Because they brought Hadith No he, but he said the word Hadith Oh sorry We're still at the stage Where they've got Hadith hey, I'm sorry, I thought he said I oh, thought he uh, came back Said Hadith is weak yeah, yeah, so, so the Hadith falls away So Abu Hanif has got Qiyas right Yeah which is better than nothing which Yeah is so now they brought, So he weakened the Hadith So yeah. Abu Hanif now has got something Hadahu, He's yeah. got Qiyas So he's now stronger so okay. the They come back and they said Okay we've got an ayah From the Quran Abu Hanif was half of the Quran Half of the Quran But not necessarily the istinbat Oh come on Are you telling me that every single Ayah in the Quran And Imam Shafi'i was asked Where's the ijma' in the Quran He went home Half of the kitabillah He scratched okay. his head And went back And finished the Quran three times Okay what's Let the ayah? Let me finish and then he came to the eye. Yeah. Okay, what's the ayah? Okay, the ayah is that the Prophet is saying 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 why couldn't you see it in the first time when he read it? The second time he couldn't even see it. The third time Shafi'i saw that this ayah is a delete for Ijma'. Not only just that, not only just that. Is, is Abu Hanifa more ahfad than uh, Uthman Ma'afan? No, he's not. Uthman radhi, Uthman radhi al anhu at his time, Abdul, Ibn Abdul Bar mentions in his Kitab al-Timheed, a woman, a woman gave birth at six months. She gave birth to a child at six months. Hmm. Ali said, and the father, the man who married her, the man who, after six months of being married to her, she gave birth. Right. He said, how is our marriage only been for six months? <laughs> You're giving birth. You got this child from somewhere else. It's wedlock. This is not my child. And he brought her to the Cape court and they looked into her situation and it became a problem. Ali ibn Abi Talib sent a letter to Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, Uthman, Sometimes it's been transmitted as Umar, but this was authentically Uthman. Okay. He sent a letter to Uthman. He said, Uthman, this woman is right. She can give birth in six months. Hey, where? In the Quran. Where? Uthman is Hafiz. He's the one who compiled the Quran. 
with his qiraat and everything, his ahruf and everything. Hmm. How? He said the ayah, وَالْقَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى وَوَصَيْنَ الْإِسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتُ أُمُّهُ كُرْهًا وَوَضَعَتُ كُرْهًا وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ شُدَّ وَبَلَغَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً إلى آخر الآية Allah says وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا The pregnancy and the breastfeeding 30 months Subtract 24 months from it Which is two years of the breastfeeding As Allah said yeah, You get six ha- left We're only left, we're left to six months right? Yeah. That six months Is called dil- Dalalatul iqtida It's a way of extracting evidences From the Quran and the Sunnah okay. It's called Dalalatul iqtida okay. Why did Uthman could not see that? Okay. What I'm trying to say to you is that No I remember before I said مَيُّرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ إِنَّمَا أَنَا قَاسِمٌ وَاللَّهُ يُعْطِي The Prophet ﷺ said Anyone who Allah wants خير for them He gives them the fiqh of the religion وَاللَّهُ Allahu Azza wa Jalla Is what? The Prophet said إِنَّمَا أَنَا قَاسِمٌ I, dis- I, dis- I distribute the knowledge وَاللَّهُ يُعْطِي Some Allah gives each one hmm. yeah. The scholars they said The knowledge is For the people The way that risk is written for them Okay. So it could happen that Imam okay. Hanifa can't see it. I still want to follow this through then. So now we we're What's na- the ayah then? So now we have a situation. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala he got responded to with an evidence from the Quran. Okay, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Baqarah he mentions the story of Ma'kar ibn Yasar al Muzani. Um, Allah says, وَإِذَا, بل- وإذا, وَإِذَا طَلَّقْتُمُ النِّسَاءَ فَبَلَغْنَ أَجَلَهُنَّ فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ أَنْ يَنْكِحْنَ أَزْوَاجَهُنَّ إِذَا تَرَاضَوْا بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ This ayah came down on Ma'akal ibn Yasar al-Muzani Ma'akal had a sister hmm. He married his sister off to a man Pay attention to this uh, To a man, his sister He married his sister off to a man And the man divorced her in a very despicable way Abhorrent way He didn't like it The way he treated his sister So what happened was The idda finished Because the woman's a- a- timing finished Her idda finished He had, he had three So cycles, whether it be Mahayr or Tuhrin, we're not going to strengthen which opinion is which. He could have taken her back. He had a chance, he had a window of taking her back. He didn't. He let that time fly by. Then what happened was the men found out Ma'akal ibn Asari's sister is available, she's looking to get married. And then he went into the line and said, I'm back. Of course, she loves her ex husband. She prefers him over any other man. Her heart it was for him. Mm-hmm. She wants him. So she said to her brother, Ma'akal, my ex-husband is back. I want him. He said, Wallahi, I'm not going to marry you off to him. Hmm. Abadan, the man who treated you the way he treated you. And the, he acted the way you acted. Now that he's found out that um, other men are coming to you. Ha. He wants to come into the... Uh, he had opportunity. Allah wa ta'ala, he said in the ayah, when if you divorce the women and their idda finishes, فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ أَنْ يَنْكِحْنَ أَزْوَاجَهُنَّ Do not prevent them from فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ Don't prevent these women that are under your guardianship to marry. Why is Allah telling Ma'akal ibn Asar don't prevent them? She could just go and get married herself. Okay, where the Sabah and Nasul, how does it reach us? How did the reason for revelation reach us? There's, there's, it's authenticity. Uh, what if he knew about it and he just didn't believe in authenticity? But the ayah, forget the Sabah and Nasul. Hatta forget the Sabah and Nasul. Okay, what is, the leave ayah the, says, leave the reason for Allah says, فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ Guardians, don't prevent the women from getting married. Jamil, which shows that they should be able to get married themselves without a no, wedding. No, no, it's saying, the don't, Guardians, don't prevent the women from getting married. Don't, yani, a man comes up for her. No, no, that's the Sabah and Nasul. We said we'll leave that. The ayah didn't say for her to marry themselves off. It didn't say that. It says, don't prevent, guardians, فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ You, well, he's, don't prevent them. يَنْكِحْنَ أَزْوَاجَهُنَّ Okay. If the women, the ayah is clear. The ayah says, if the women, but this is my point. This ayah is clearly saying, if the woman wants to go and marry a man, don't stop her marrying this man. Why would, okay, look. That's on his side, not on this. Okay, okay, don't stop them, okay. Yeah. Okay, let's say that's even his advantage. Yeah. Why would Allah talk to the men? When the woman could just go and get married, why did she even need his consent, Aslan? Because maybe at that time, people believe that the woman can't get married because they have this hadith, which is da'if. Which they have is? This, this hadith that Abu Hanifa says is weak. Yeah. So the men were preventing and Allah is saying, don't prevent them. Two, things, them two things, two things. For example, I'm just giving two things, two things. The ayah is talking to the men who are guardians over the girl. Okay. And it's telling the girls. It's telling the men. The, the men, the guardians. Yeah, it's telling the guardians, don't prevent. Don't stop marrying them off. To the men that they want of their choice. That's what the eyes is. Don't prevent the women from marrying yes. them off to the men that they yes. that they think is fit for them. Okay. 
I, you have no control over this. Let her do her own. No, marriage. don't marry them off. Ayyuh. Sorry, don't stop marrying them off. That's what it's talking to the guardian. <laughs> Confuse me as well. Go on. What's the, the ayah saying? The ayah is saying, yani, oh guardians, yeah. if this sister brings a brother she likes, yeah. She wants this man. No, okay, well, you're adding stuff into the ayah because the ayah doesn't say brother she likes. And no, no, I'm explaining Stick to, to the ayah, please. The yeah, ayah say, فَلَا تَعَضُلُوهُنَّ mm. Do not, O oh guardians, do not stop them. فَلَا تَعَضُلُوهُنَّ Do not stop them. أَنْ يَنْكِحْنَ أَزْوَاجَهُنَّ To marry them off to the men. Yeah. To marry them off to the men. So yeah. marrying her off is by the guardian. That's Allah what the ayah said. Don't stop. As in, you have no control of it. Uh, Habibi, do you understand why? Abu Hanifa, these mis- do you understand why this can get a bit complex? No, I mean, it can't. The fact that we're talking no, about it, it for the last 15 minutes shows. No, but, yes, yes. <laughs> huh? No, what well, I'm saying, I, my point is. I can, I, there's people who would argue right now, even if you're, if this podcast is happening, and they can make a two hours discussion over it. It doesn't give it a valid argument. But do you What I'm trying to say to you is that you're right. There are always going to be people who argue. There are always people who are going to be stubborn and hard headed. They're always going to try to prove their point. My point is Al Imam Abu Hanifa here, with insaf, with justice, with fairness, he doesn't have argument to stand on. His issue is no evidences for it. It's just what? A, um, uh, what do you call it? An uh, uh, issue of. Uh, it's an issue of. Um, uh, each qiyas, qiyas, qiyas okay. that he used, and these ulama who are more than him in number, more knowledgeable. That mean yeah, more, 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 more. It doesn't necessarily by itself. It doesn't. But okay. when it adds on to other things, second thing is they're minhu bil hadith. They're more knowledgeable than him in hadith. Who authenticated it? And Al Imam Abu Hanifa, to be honest, in the concept of hadith, he's weak. Aslan. Nobody weak in hadith. Out of the people who are strong in hadith, nobody weak. In no, I'm saying to you, that, uh, take the hadith sahih or daif. Yeah. But what we have is that. We have, I mean, there's few ever, uh, few other evidences I can bring you. But the discussion that we're going to have here is that Al-Imam Abu Hanifa is standing on Qiyas. These scholars are standing on an ayah from the Quran. Depending this, on how you interpret it. No, interpret it. Okay, give me another interpretation of that. Okay. I, I gave you. And give me where you got that interpretation. <laughs> okay, good I question. Know. Okay. Because I, I brought you the Sabah Nuzul that came down, which is Sahih. Which could... Okay, this is my argument. This is my position. This is my position. You present your position. This is my position now. Okay. And all of these masail, these imams, these great noble imams who you respect and you love and you honor. No, there are, Sh- 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 you're confusing two things. I don't want you to confuse two Go things. On. There are issues, the way you're presenting the argument, I would say, yes, you're right. Yeah. It's not fair to push Abu Hanifa, the, يعني, يعني Abu Hanifa Rahim, in this issue, he's got his point. Mm. And I can see where he's, why he got he has his opinion and I respect the other party and he's a Hanafi and I wouldn't make a d- big issue about it. Like putting your hand under your shor- under your, your navel or whatever. I'm fine with all of that. I have no issue with it. The issue of moving your finger in the salah. They don't believe it's permissible yeah. and others believe it's permissible. I won't make a big hoo-ha about it because it's an issue that the difference here is valid. Yeah. What I'm saying... Like in here, dalilun غير دليل. What I'm saying is every single mas'ala, we're not talking about the mas'ala that you just mentioned, right. every single issue. My argument is that these great noble imams, they didn't just make up their verdicts based on their own desires, which I'm sure you would even say that they didn't do this. Agreed? No, can, I, can, I, can I answer that point? Of course you can. Every scholar gave a verdict on a dalil he has. Okay. And some issues they didn't have evidences. Okay. And they gave their verdict on a lower graded ruling. So they based it on a what? Yeah, Qiyas for example Because the evidence Didn't reach them Or Let me finish it, Okay go on So in this situation For Imam Abu Hanifa He looked for an ayah Couldn't see anything From the ayat It didn't seem like that to him Hadith It didn't come across an, A narration for it What did he now do He gave The third option He gave Qiyas At this moment He's the upper hand Fine We're with him Then a delil Came from someone Who has it They brought it to the table where if Abu Hanifa was to get it, this is the point I'm trying to say. If he was to get it, he wouldn't argue like the way you're How trying. How do you know he didn't get it, but he just didn't believe it? Because authentic. all of them has been transmitted from them. They said, Ida Sahal Hadith of Madhabi. If they, they how many issues did they came back come back from? Hmm. They themselves, if they hmm. were everything that they said was based on all of the evidences, why did they do Tarajah? Why did Ahmed turn away from some issues? Why did Shafi'i have a Madhab al Qadim and Madhab al Jadid? Why? Why? Okay. My 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 question goes back to if this imam, which you believe that would not make verdicts based on his desires, can we at least agree on that? He wouldn't make rulings based on his desires. But he will make it based on his ijtihad. Agreed. Not on delil. I agree with you. Not on a delil. Okay, I agree. No problem. Okay. Let's go back to the Battle of Ahzab. 
The companions made their decision based on their ijtihad. Okay. Some of them prayed later after the time of Asr. Some of them prayed at the time of Asr. They went back to the Prophet ﷺ. They wanted to get a verdict. Which one of us was right? Which one of us was wrong? What did he say to them? Did he say both of you are right? Did he say you are wrong? He, but I'm saying the Prophet didn't say both of you why are right. Why didn't? If the truth is haq, if the truth is wahid, one. Oh, yeah. Why didn't he say you were wrong uh, and you were right? Like you're saying now, because you know, you're saying something you know why? that he never... Okay, let me answer your question. Go let me answer your question. The reason why he said that he was that he was teaching us something. The people are going to come later. That there are evidences that are going to be like that where we have to respect each other in the way that we deal with each other on this issue. So there are going to be texts. When we read it, this person is going to understand it like that. And this person is going to understand it like that. And that this is called an ijtihad and that we need to respect one another but in no way shape or form in that hadith that you brought did the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam say both opinions that are yani, on two different yani, spectrums both of them are right no he didn't say that but why if there is a clear ayah from the quran that tells you you have to pray on time you're saying if you have a delay which is a ayah from the quran no, no, forget, it takes precedence over yeah, everything yeah, forget, forget it takes precedence over no, your no, no, forget, forget the issue of Yani, ayah, you're bringing something external Put that aside for me They have a statement from the messenger mm. They all just looked at that hadith one, one of the groups restricted himself to the wording And another one he done He looked at the overall meaning The wisdom behind why the prophet said it This is exactly what the madahibs are like mm. And I said that to you beginning, at the beginning And therefore they can all be right Because he never said you were no, wrong No, I'm not That's why I said to you, Both parties who went to the battle of Ahzab The prophet said to Banu Quray That I told you both of them are not right but he, if they were both not right, he would have said you were wrong, and he would have no. taught us a lesson, and the lesson would be greater that for the fact Actually, that the truth is one. Uh, again, that's my point. I, I, I this, this is a long time ago since I looked at it, when I looked at this discussion of the Hadith of Banu Quraiza and what yeah. the scholars. Just, I can't really put my finger on it now, but there was qara'in, qara'in, yani indications mm. that alluded that the party that was. Seeing it as the Prophet saying hasten were right. There were external narrations that indicated that that was right. It would have been nice if you, if you, to prove your point, it would be nice if he said, You guys were right, you guys wrong. And I could have no response to you. But the fact that he didn't shows that I've got a, no, but an argument on my side. That there are every issue in Islam. Yes, both parties Islam. can be right. What's your evidence for that? The, the hadith of Hazab. The, the hadith of Hazab, the Prophet didn't say both parties are right. Okay, but he didn't say. He just didn't blame both parties. Okay. And I'm saying to you, that's true. We can't blame. The issue of niqab, one party could not blame the other party. They said he had. You're right. That's all that that hadith shows. That there's sinning is not on any party here. There's no one leaving with a sin. Hmm. Okay. But the truth is one. Okay. The haq is. Okay, fine. I want to try and summarize the discussion so far. And I know that we've spoken a lot. We've gone on a couple of tangents here and there. You started by talking about the importance of the Quran and the Sunnah. And I think, like I said at the start, that's nothing that any Muslim within mainstream Sunni Islam really disagrees with. However, the difficulty comes with how do you get to the Quran and the Sunnah? And that's where you split the people into three groups. You said there's, there's a mujtahid, which is basically the scholar who is able to go directly to the text and come up with his rulings. And you said that even in him in some issues, he may drop down to the second or the first level. Mm -hmm. The second level being the mutabi, the follower. And this person isn't, hasn't got the ability to go directly into the text himself, but he has the ability to see what the mujtahideen said about the, the, the different rulings. And he has the ability to look into it and who is stronger, who is weaker, what evidence are they using, what evidence they're using, let's list them out and let's make a decision. That is the second level. The first level where, like we said, the majority of the people fall in, this is the muqallid, the blind follower, who basically doesn't have the ability to go to the Quran and Sunnah himself. And he also doesn't have the ability to look at the different evidences and make a decision on which is better, which is more stronger. His job is to basically ask someone what is the ruling on this particular issue. And you also outline some conditions for the person he's asking. There must be someone who has knowledge. There must be someone who has piety. And also they can't be a muqallid themselves. There can't be someone who says, I'm an imam of a masjid. I am pious, or they wouldn't say that, but I, they're seen as someone who's pious. And then I only follow from this one person, this one madhab. That makes him a muqallid and therefore he can't be asked. Okay, my question for the muqallid doing out there, the people who are falling into this category of being blind followers. I have a question that splits into two. First of all, do they have to ask for the evidence 
in every single ruling when they ask the imam that they're trusting? Do they have to ask for the evidence? Um, and secondly, do they have to understand that evidence if they do ask for it? Um, as I mentioned to you before, the ami for me is a person who does have who doesn't have no knowledge. And as I mentioned, this is what it's called. Amiyu is a person who doesn't know anything. There's no knowledge. That person doesn't have a madhab. His madhab is the ma person he asks. Hmm. If that person is a shafi, he's a shafi. If that person is a hanbali, he's a hanbali. He doesn't know anything. He blind follows what is given to him. He trusts this person's knowledge, understanding, comprehension, whatever it is, he takes it from the person. The ami has no madhab. He can't ask for dalil. Okay. He won't understand the dalil and the okay. evidences. The dalil is asked by only two parties Or the dalil is only observed and looked at By only two parties of people And that is the um, the mujtahid Who goes directly to the dalil himself And extracts rulings from it And the mutabi' Who looks at the understanding of the great scholars of Islam And he basically uh, observes how they commented on that evidence And their rulings and the understanding they uh, ex extracted from the uh, evidence So a ami doesn't have any rights to ask any evidences okay. He wouldn't even understand if the evidence were, were told to him An example of a ami is a, a new Muslim Yeah but there's also many Muslims who have been born Muslims Maybe practicing even for 10-15 years But they fall into this category They just yeah. don't have knowledge of usul al fiqh yeah. Arabic yeah, etc yeah, yeah. Those people yeah. Yeah. Those so they from, don't have from, a, from a river who just took Islam yeah. Up to the person who's a Muslim and he's just got, yani, uh, he has Islam yani, by name and he prays, he knows how to pray, he prays as a Muslim. He has no other knowledge about Islam. That person is a Ami. No, but even further than that, what I'm saying is someone might be studying the deen even, but they haven't got to the level of Arabic language or Surah al fiqh, but they might have memorized the Quran, for example. They yeah, might he, be he, he's still a Ami. He's still a Ami, yeah. Okay. So he just goes to the local Imam and he okay. asks. And he doesn't have to, have to ask for. He's not a student of knowledge. A student isn't? of knowledge is. The mutabi' who is able to look at the evidences and whatnot. Okay, perfect. Does that change depending on what aspect of Islam he's asking for? For example, if he's asking for a fiqh ruling, he could just follows it without dalil. What if that is an an issue of aqidah now? Aqidah, you don't do taqlid of. You're not allowed to. Aqidah meaning aqidah is only one, so it's what Allah Taala and His Messenger said, and he does no opinions, so um, and he can't. He doesn't, there's no views and madahibs in mm. the concept of Tawheed and whatnot. Tawheed, he just has to take on board Qala Allah and Qala Rasul. And so um, in Tawheed, there is no taqlid. Does he become like a mujtahid then in the, in the aqidah? Like, how does that work? How does he know what Qala Allah is Qala Rasul? So he stays away, for example, a person of deviation, a grave worshipper, or something like that. He doesn't. He doesn't ask him any questions uh, because these issues are not, yani, taking a, a person's opinion. Mm. It's not about like, for example, the differences between the Brailwiya and the Diobandiya and the Ahlul Hadith, Ahlul Sunnah, Salafiyun. It's not a fiqhi rulings that we're differing upon. It's not like Hanafiya. Shafi'iyya, Malikiyya, Hanabila That's not what the difference here The difference here is Sunnah Bid'ah The Brailwiyya and the Diobandiyya is Ahlul Bid'ah Okay, the Brailwiyya are Kuffar, they're not Muslims And the Diobandis on the other hand are Mubtadi'a Dallun Mudil Misguided people hmm. Anyone who attributes that belief and that ideology is Mubtadi'a He's a misguided individual Now the Salafiyun are on the other side So Ahlul Haq, he has to only follow the people of truth hmm. Okay Okay Um you said at the start of this that the issue of tamadhub, actually there is a middle path and there's two extremes. For the, you know, the, the, so far during this podcast, I've kind of been presenting one side of the argument. I almost now want to change hats and I want to go to the other party that will attack you from the other side and say that your stance is still wrong for the following reasons. This party believe that there should be no madahib whatsoever. Get rid of them all. Let's just get rid of them. And there are some notable scholars who have this kind of opinion as well. Okay. And I think one of their strongest arguments, or one of the arguments they start with, is that these madahib all came after al qurun al mufaddala There's three golden generations that you say, khayrun nasi qarni thumma ladhin yalunum. These three golden generations that you say we should take our religion from, all four of these imams came after that. So just to add on to that, the ayah that you quoted earlier, al-yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum, these imams came after that ayah. 
So adding a madhab into the religion after it was completed and after the Salaf understood it and after the three generations came and went, isn't that an issue and something problematic against your core beliefs of understanding the religion the way they understood it? So your question, there's two perspectives to look at it. From the pres first perspective is that attributing yourself to a madhab. Attributing to your, yourself to a madhab, then there's no evidence to prevent a person from doing that. Even though it came after the... There's no Salaf people attribute themselves to countries and they attribute themselves to tribes. and It's just, it's, it has no problems. There's no evidence that merely attributing yourself to these madahibs is a problem. Okay. The second thing is tariqatul ulama, the, the ways of the early scholars, the sabiqeen, noble scholars. We respect, we admire them. Like Shaykh al-Islam Taymi, Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn al-Rajab, Ibn Abi al-Aziz al-Hanafi. And other than them, who are considered ulama al-muhaqqiqeen. And they've reached the daraja to tahqiq. These great scholars, a lot of them like Shaykh al-Islam Taymi, Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn al-Rajab, Ibn Abi al-Aziz al-Hanafi, and other great scholars, all of whom يعني, affirmed the, the, the permissibility of attributing yourself to a madhab. So there isn't a problem in that issue. Um, now we come back to the issue of Studying and learning these madahibs mm. You see We have two issues These people they kind of allow the Amatun nas Like the beginner student of knowledge And everyone They give him the rights to go and do ijtihad Which is a problem in some way Then to do ijtihad There has to be ala And it has to have some instrumental knowledge That the person has to have And I know there's a difference between Ijtihad and itiba'u dalil Hence why I said Itiba'u dalil Following the dalil is different from ijtihad Okay because a person can follow the delil and not necessarily be a mujtahid. Like the muttabi'ah. Mm. The muttabi'ah who's not doing ijtihad, he's following the delil. And the mujtahid who's doing ijtihad is also following the, the delil because that's where he's getting it from. So this is where they're equating one with the other. They're saying follow the evidence. But their follow of the evidence means do ijtihad, mm. which is another extreme. But if you mean by follow the delil, I am following the delil by using the statements of the ulama to understand the delil. I'm a beginner student of knowledge. I'm not uh, alim. I use their statement to understand. Hmm. And I think if that is understood, the issue can be resolved. Another thing I feel like is that, and this is something I've observed and I've seen, it's that some people equate to tamadhub taqlid. They make one and the other the same. And I kind of pointed that out. Yeah. Tamadhub doesn't necessarily mean it's taqlid. And I've given the difference between the two. Tamadhub can be a stepping stone and it has been a stepping stone for ijtihad for great scholars of Islam who at the beginning of Islam learned madhab through madhab became mujtahideen. Rather, I don't know. I've, I've, I don't know any alim except that he went through a madhab. Hmm. So you Apart can, from the ulama before the madhab came into existence, right? I'm saying, of course, after it came, that's where we can assess the issue, yeah. right? So I don't know any scholar, alim, that I can say he's so alim. But that, there is, yeah, sorry, go on. That yeah. has not gone through madhab as a stepping stone. Well, that you can say following a madhab is a ijma' fi'li. But there are other ways, like Iqna, Ibn Mundir, his kitab. There is another way, Manhaj al-Salikin, al-Sa'di, al-Shawkani has a book. There are other ways to reach fiqh. Without going through a madhab, I'm right? Not saying that You're you, not saying it's the only I'm way. Not, I'm not saying, of course I'm not saying that. I'm saying you can't take other ways, but learning a madhab is as hell, is easier, simpler, and more beneficial. You'll see the fruits that you reap. Can also be a lot of harm. For example, the people- It's not a harm in and within itself. It's, uh, the, it's, it's like, it's the way you use it. Yes, There's nothing necessarily wrong about, unless of course you're not seeing tamadhab as taqlid, if you're seeing tamadhub as not necessarily taqlid. Hmm. But that's where the lines get blown. You basically said that, obviously we know in this day and age that people do blindly follow a single imam. It does happen. We agree it does happen. We're not saying they're right. They just stick to one imam. Abdul Latif, Muhammad ibn Abdul Latif. Hmm. He said that the kitab al-iqna'a wal-muntaha, they go a lot of the times against al-imam Ahmed. Al-iqna'a yeah. by al Hajawi. It goes a lot of the times against the madhab of Imam Muhammad. Okay. Are we all together? Yeah. Um, Muhammad Abdul Hab said the same. Muhammad Abdul Latif said the same. My point to you is that, see, there's a difference between Ahmed said this and I'm blind following Imam Muhammad or I'm blind following a madhab. Hmm. 
Now a madhab, I'm not blind following, I'm upon a madhab. It's different from I'm blind following an individual. Tamadhub means madrasa. Okay. It's not individual. You're it's not at. individual? Ah, no, no, no. It's a whole entire sift, cleansed, worked on decades, يعني, يعني centuries. It's been sift. It went through the time test. Yeah. يعني, it was being tested through criticism, back and forward. It's, it's been maneuvering all through that. But even then, you can't just stick to one madrasa. Yeah, no, that's what I'm trying to say to you. Okay, and which you said before and you clarified why. Mm. My point is that we do have people who stick to one and they're very proud of it. And they say, this is all right, this is it. This, okay, you by opening this door of madahib in the first place, have actually, without intending to, have actually given them, you basically said, jump in the water and don't get wet. No, I didn't. Of no. course, they're going to follow one because you know the way the people are. They're proud of this. They, they take pride in this. It's better to close the door of madahib altogether, get rid of them, and tell people follow the delete. It's like saying I'm, throw, I'm going to throw the water with the fish. I'm going to throw the fish with the water with it. Mm. You don't throw the. You know, wait. What you can do is, you can do something better, which is what. First of all, teach your students before you go through the madhab books that the madhab is a means. It's not the ultimate goal. In the first session of your class, talk about ta'adim al nusus, which we did today. We did. Venerating the evidences and how important the evidences are and the delil and whatnot. With that being said, I can say to you honestly, it's hard, it's really hard to study fiqh properly, yani tasawrul masail, hmm. to have good perception of the masail, okay? To really take it in. And then to have a gradual, yani step by step to get there, I, I don't know any way easier than to madhu. Talab al is not easy, and just because a path is easy doesn't mean it's the right path that we should take. But it. you have, for example, let me say to you, I drove on a road, and I drove, 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 drove and I got to the road, and I saw it was locked, it was a blocked road. Okay. There was no sign for it. I came back. It took me half an hour to drive on that road. I mm. came back. I saved you time. I said, look, Habibi, I've, drove, I've driven on that road. It's blocked. Don't go on that road. Is it, is it not dim-witted on your behalf for you to say, no, I want to see it for myself. I'm going to go. It depends because the road you direct me to might also have its harms. No, I'm not going to direct you to a road. I'm just saying to you, that road, don't take it. Okay. And the, the road you're referring to is and I, that, that's leaving a madhab. I'm saying to you, the great scholars of Al-Islam shortened the path for you. They saw the faults and the mistakes and the errors. You know, all these madhabs, where are they taken from? These madhabs are taken not from mid, do you think it's taken from midair? No, it's not. It's taken from the hadith that were read, hmm. the nusus that were read, the qawa'id that was brought out. Furu' was brought out of it. Furu' Those furu' that came out for that madhab, it's been sift, it's been critiqued. It got within them, they differed amongst themselves, they had views and etc. What I'm saying to you is that I'm not saying it's also a Yani uh, verbatim, you know, divine law from Allah. It's not. But the benefit for you is, even if there's mistakes in it, the benefit you learn is that it gives you the ability to perceive shurutu salah, how much? Mubtilatu salah, the nullifies of the praise, how much? You understand it. The arkanus, you learn all of that. Now, when you say to me, for example, I'm going to take, for example, Muhammad Ali Shawkani's Dawrul al Bahiyya. It's, it's a kitab which is in Islam Madhabi. Manaj al some scholars they say it's still Abdul Rahman Nasr al Saudi, who is a yani, ha, Imam studied in the Hanbali Madhab and whatnot. And his student is Abdullah ibn Aqil, uh, who is a great Hanbali of this time. The point I'm trying to come to is Manaj al Sheikh Salah ibn, Abd, ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Husayn, says that it's a Hanbali book, oh. it's a Hanbali text. Like in Ad-Durar al-Bahiyya fi al-Masail al-Fiqiyya by Shawkani is considered to be a kitab which is not on any madhab. But then I'm going to take one man's book and I'm going to leave a madhab, madhab. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't just have just one person. Because you it's said It's being that, scrutinized. It's yeah. been, by the way, each madhabs, there are a'immatul hadith in there. There's not just, like for, let's take Shafi'i madhab. We've got Ibn Hajar on this, in this madhab. Mm -hmm. We've got Bayhaqi in this madhab. Mm -hmm. They've got Nawawi in this madhab. We've got uh, Ibn Mulaqin in this madhab. We have Sarajuddin Bulqin in this madhab. We have, yani, we have big giants in hadith. I'm doing this. Al Rafi, by the way, is an Imam in hadith, by the way. We have all these people. Aima, Zainuddin Iraqi. All these great scholars are Shafi'iyah. 
they're not without hadiths. Bayaqi's kitab, Sunan al-Kubra, is considered to be the biggest kitab in hadith al-Hakam that he wrote for the Shafi'i Madhab. Are we all together? Yeah. So, to say that I'm just going to dismiss all of that and then I'm going to straight away jump into a kitab, yani, Bulul Maram, for example, and I'm going to, the fiqh is just going to come from there. Bulul Maram is not organized for you. By the way, the kitab Bulul Maram, and, I, and I, this is my research cool. and, and kalam of the fatah of the ulama and everything that they've said I've read. Anyone who doesn't do these five things will never become a faqih, never become a alim, cool. historically when we check it. If the person doesn't do furu' al fiqhiyya ala madhabin, we just tell him the fiqh in a yani furu' fiqhiyya in a madhab. You're saying without doing that, you're saying that it's obligatory to become an no, alim. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying you're saying to become an alim, you have to go through a madhab. No, I'm saying to you, we've seen. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not going to just explain other. I'm just saying to you, this, I, we haven't seen anyone who has become a faqih. And a person can't be a faqih. In the time that we're living in today, the umar and the life span of the person is very short in order to reach where you're reaching if you don't take these steps. And see, you'll see it for yourself. Al furu' al fiqiyah. Al furu' al fiqiyah, you study matan in madhab. Matta bi shuja'ah, yaqutu al nafis, al zubad, umdatu al salik, umdatu al nasik, lil min al aqib al misri, al min hajj by no way. For example, those are shafi'i books. That's furu' al fiqiyah. Then you, once you do furu' al fiqiyah, you go to usul al fiqh. And then you go qawa'id al fiqiyah. And then you go to, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, you go to Adilatul Ahkam, Hadith al Bulugh al Maram, Umdatul Ahkam, and whatnot. And the fifth one is Maqasid al Sharia. With those five, a Talib al does that, Alhamdulillah, he's on a path. After you finished all of that, you took Usul al Fiqh, you studied Waraqat, you finished it. You went to Risalat al Latifa, you finished it. Usul min al you finished it. Maqaid al Fusul, you finished that. You took Kitab Rawdatul Nadir wa Junnatul Munadir. You finished that. You took Al Mustafa by Hamid Ghazali. You finished that. You took the Kitab, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, what's it called? The Maraqis Su'ud, the Mubtag al Su'ud. You memorized that and you finished the Shuruhat on it. You got, went to Jam al Jawami, you finished it, you studied that. You went to Qawaid al Fiqiyah, you did the same. One of the good Kitabs, Ashbah al Nadari by Suyuti, for example, or the Nadma of Al Baraid, Al Faraid al Bahiyya, you do that. All of these books is a manhaj, one book after the other, organized for you. Tartib, Muratab. It's the it's like jumping from primary school and going directly to secondary school. You're jumping years that you needed. It's Annie, have we seen people? I'm asking you a question, have we seen people today who have now become scientists, doctors, uh, in the world does it exist? People who are millionaires, businessmen who've not gone through schools. Yes. We've seen people who actually have done medicine and whatnot, but not having they haven't gone through the rice. Yeah, you know, they haven't gone through school or anything. That doesn't mean that that's the way that it happens. Majority of people need this, and there are people. قد, قد, وقد, وقد. Okay. Istitnaat can happen, but what I'm trying to say is that this tariqa is sahlun. It's not wajib. Hmm. If you leave it, you don't get sin for it. It's not even mustahab. I'm not even saying it's mustahab. All I'm saying is mubah. It's permissible. And it's good, if it's actually better for you in from not from a shalali perspective, but from university, what we've seen is mm. beneficial for you. Use it as a stepping stone. Use it as a wasila to get to uh, uh, the uh, understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. That's what you, the aim is the Quran and the Sunnah. But what happens is these people who are against madhab are fighting another group who are fanatic in madhab. Those two parties are both extreme. Okay. And I said to you beginning, in the middle path. Madhab, we don't want to toss it all. We want to take the khair and the good in it. It's a great imams of Islam. The Ummah praised. They were, and I remember brothers who used to be fully against Tamadhub and did not like Tamadhub and belittle Tamadhub and you, 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 you put it down. Finally came back after they got tired and they couldn't really get anywhere. They came back. So, do it. And when they came back, it was a problem again because they went to the other extreme. Ta'asub. Mm. Another extreme. So don't go to extremes. Just be in the okay. middle. Okay, I want to end with some closing questions before I'm going to give you the opportunity to summarize what we've discussed so far. The first question I have is, we spoke a lot about ijtihad and the mujtahid. 
is it even possible nowadays for someone to become a mujtahid? Or are we just saying that this level of ijtihad by saying that it even exists in the first place, we're kind of giving false hope to the people to reach a level that they'll never be able to. Is this chapter actually still open or is it closed? There's a great book written by Sheikh Jalaluddin al-Suyuti rahimahullah ta'ala. He called it Al-Raddu ala man akhlada ila al-ard. And in this book he talks about that the chapter of ijtihad is not closed. Amir Sanani has also a risala written on the fact that ijtihad is still open and it's not closed. And there's a funny story because Suyut rahimahullah, there was a, uh, he was at a time when uh, people were saying that the uh, chapter of ijtihad is closed, it's gone, it's finished, there's no ijtihad whatsoever. And so Suyuti claimed to be a mujtahid. Uh-huh. He said, I'm a mujtahid, I'm not muqallid. And uh, so he said, if anybody wants to debate with me on this issue, I'm, I'm, I'm open for it. And then he said, the person who debates with me can't be a muqallid. Because a muqallid, yeah. he's not a, a scholar. So he, a muqallid is a blind follower. So if he's a blind follower, he can't debate me. And he said, if the person who's debating with me is a mujtahid, then why are we debating for? <laughs> yeah, very true. So he wrote that kitab, Ar-Raddu ala man akhlada ila al-ard. And he went back and forth with Shamsuddin al-Sakhawi and him went back and forth on this issue and wa ma ila dhali. Um, the person has to never belittle uh, the blessings of Allah wa ta'ala. He should always work hard, exert the effort, come with what it takes to become mujtahid. The shurut ulama set. Learn those shurut. Master the Arabic language. Yeah, and he study it very deeply. Also study qawaid al fiqhiyah Also al fiqh mustalah al hadith. And he study uh, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Study the Quran and the qiraat and whatnot. Inshallah taala, you can become a mujtahid. Okay. Uh, the next question I have is more of a practical one. We've spoken a lot about theory. Um, how do you practically follow a madhab in the 21st century? What is a methodology? I think before that would be a good question. How does one even choose a madhab? Mm-hmm. You see, choosing a madhab, the scholars, when they speak about it, they mention it from two perspectives. The first one is, uh, baladin, the persons in a land, and the people of that land that you're in are all upon a particular madhab. The story that happened with Abi Ya'la, Sahib al tabaqat He, a man came up to him and he said, I want to study with you. And he advised him and he said, go and study the madhab of your land and the people of your land. So if a person is from the, yani India, he's from Pakistan and from those areas, he should, be, it's better for him to study the Hanafi madhab. Because when you go back to your community and you want to, mm, it's good to know the madhab of that land. Yeah. The second one is, you're in a land Yani, the madhahibs are many. Muta'addidatul madhahib, there's many madhahibs there. Or la madhab fi, or there's no madhab. They don't follow a madhab in this land. Then here you, sh- you choose a madhab. And the madhab that you choose, choose it for two reasons. First reason is that it's the best in terms of the usul istidlal al fiqhi. That the principles that it's built on is the best. And the second one is لَهُ, It's more clearer for you to or it's more clearer for you to go and pr- study it with a scholar. Okay. Yani if I take this madhab on, I can there's someone who can teach me. I mean, there's someone I who knows it very well. It's easy to access, kind of like easy access. Yeah. Don't just choose it merely uh, because um yani it sounds like the majority of people follow this one, but when you choose it, you don't have anyone to teach you. Okay. So choose it on those two reasons. Um, the, I'm sorry. How does now a person study a madhab? Yeah. Each madhab, there's a beginner stage and there's a middle stage and there's an advanced stage. So, ala sabili tamteel, lal hasr, shafi'i madhab, there are books that you have to go through or you should go through in order to understand the next book and then the next book and the next book. So a person starts with madhabi shuja, he finishes that, he studies it and then he goes for the yaqutu nafis Finishes that, studies it very deeply. Then he goes for Az-Zubad ibn Raslan. He understands it. And he, then he goes for Umdatul Salik or Umdatul Nasik ibn Naqib al-Masri. And then he finishes that. And then he goes for the Minhaj of Al-Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala. Once he finishes that, he can go to the Kitab, uh, uh, kitab uh, Irshad by uh, uh, Bakr ibn Mukhri. After that, 
you read yourself it's your mutala'a go to the majmu' of Nawawi go to Mughni go to Muhalla ibn Hazm go to the works of Ibn Taymiyyah go to the works of now you're free no one should stop you you study the upon a madhab you're good to go and every madhab they have that mm. uh, you study those books in those madhabs no. Uh, the final, or the penultimate question, I'm going to add one more after this, is um, we spoke a lot about the four madhahib. Some people say there's actually a fifth madhahib, the dahiri madhahib. Do you accept this as a madhahib? So the scholars, they differ upon the, the, the dahiriya madhahib. Is the khilaf that the dahiriya bring to the table, is it taken into consideration? And is there ijma'ah? Okay. Is it taken into consideration? Yani if there's an ijma'ah and the dahiriya go against it, can we say there's ijma'ah in this issue? Fine, okay. or, if or do they break the ijma? Just yeah. In other words, do they have the the reason why this khilaf actually comes? And many people don't understand why is because the the uh, the um, zahiriya they don't accept qiyas, hmm. and a qiyas is a pillar for ijma uh, for ijtihad. Hmm. They don't accept qiyas as a pillar. That means they're not mujtahid, and the mujtahid the asal of what he's needed for is the qiyas, is the qiyas. That's his main field. And if they don't even accept Qiyas, they're not Mujtahideen. If they're not Mujtahideen, their Khilaf is Ghayru Mu'tabar. Oh, I see. Meaning it's not accepted. It's not accepted. Mm. And I'm, 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 I'm really speaking loosely and I'm not, sure. Sure, I'm not being technical, but that, I'm trying to summarize it. That's where it goes back to. Okay. So the Khilaf of the Zahiriya, that which seems apparent with Ilmu and Allah is that if they bring something and that there is no Ijma' before them, they can't break an Ijma'. The Zahiriya cannot break an ijma'ah. So if there's an ijma'ah that has been established so and they go against it, even if it's not an issue that involves qiyas. No, the, the khilaf is not mutabar. If there's an ijma'ah, the khilaf is mutabar. Okay. Um, like if it's a mas'ala khilafiyyah, there's a khilafi issue, then inshallah ta'ala, yani there's an opinion that stands. No. Okay. Uh, final question I have for you is that we've obviously spoken about the Salaf and I know from your previous lessons and lectures you obviously are always calling people to take their knowledge from the Salaf and obviously the Imams of the Madahib they are from the, well, the early few generations my question for you is that in your lectures you also speak a lot about Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen Al-Bani who obviously was against Madahib Sheikh Bin Baz Salih Al-Fawzan how do you reconcile this where you're teaching you're always calling uh, to these people or not necessarily to these people but you're mentioning their names and then you're still telling people take your knowledge from the early generations isn't that a contradiction by the way many people have a misconception with Sheikh Albani uh, Sheikh Albani rahimahullah ta'ala actually did say uh, rahimahullah ta'ala study the madhab books he's not against it really no he's not Sheikh Nasser unrestrictedly no he's against the asub being okay. fanatic towards madhab okay rahimahullah ta'ala and the Sheikh, Sheikh himself studied uh, Hanafi madhab and then he became uh, um, uh, imam who looks at the delil and the nusus himself. So why is his position? Why is his position misunderstood? Because essentially his position is the same position as all of the imams who are against taasub, but they're not against the tamadhub. Why is he taken as someone who is misunderstood as that he's totally against the madahib? Because Sheikh Nasr rahimahullah taala, when he took on the concept of following the Quran and the Sunnah, the Sheikh rahimahullah taala, his position is, and you tend to find. Any other mashayikh, you might feel sometimes they lead, they've been pushed back by the madhab that they were upon before. And it has that, it drags them back. Like Sheikh Nasr rahimahullah ta'ala doesn't, doesn't look at it like that. Well, that I do say to brothers, and this is the advice of some of the mashayikh, that Sheikh Al-Albani's works is not good for a beginner student of knowledge to necessarily go directly to the works of Sheikh Al-Albani and also Sheikh, um, uh, also Ibn Hazmin. Because the person should first of all start with ala tariqat kutub the muhad yani start with the works of yani um the books of tamadhub learn it master it and once you reach and you benefit from that sheikh nasr would be a good benefit for you in order to know where to go right and wrong the sheikh did a lot of tamhis uh, rahimahullah and this advice was given by sheikh sulaiman al ruhayna and i think it's a very okay. strong advice okay. to for a student of knowledge to actually understand but Sheikh Al-Bani is in the books like that are beneficial. La shakka wa a student can study and learn it. Lakin, reading the views and the fatawa of Sheikh Al-Bani, rahimahullah ta'ala, before you go to kutub of the ulama, for example, like uh, the madahibs and whatnot, and stand that. Because sometimes it puts on a lot of people who haven't studied systematically. They start saying, la yajuz, 
before you reach that point and you say la yajuz oh yajuz please study yani systematically yeah. in other words i think he's also very outspoken against ta'assub and people have interpreted that as being him against tamadhub oh because he's so God. outspoken no okay. so there's always balance the sheikh was and there are, from his fatawa there are times he you know instructs the students to study books of madahibs he's against the concept of you know, ta'assub of the madahibs um sheikh ibn baz and sheikh uh, muhammad ibn salih al uthaymin were also aima of hadith they weren't muta'assibin of the hanafi madhab uh, hanbali madhab they were not actually to be honest saudi is changing now it's not like how it used to be before yeah, you said that yeah, yeah. Uh, sheikh ibn baz is different you can always tell like when you listen to his fatawa i listen to his fatawa nurun ala darb uh, his majmu'ul fatawa i've read it once all of it and sheikh ibn baz ikhtiyarat and his opinions a lot of the times is not based on the uh, the madhab mm. but even subhanallah i had i'm not by uh, a reliable brother who said that sheikh ibn uthaymin in his zad al mustaqli over 300 masail he went against the madhab wow one of the takatir teaching in the jamia he said about 300 issues sheikh muhammad ibn salih al uthaymin in his zad went against the madhab so he was encouraging the students not to read it right uh, also um uh, If you look at the Jamia now in Saudi Arabia, they've they've taken about they've taken out some of the books that were were, were proof that they were about yani and it also wasn't really there. Like for example, now Rodul Murbi is taught in the and they took out Vidayat al Mujtahid that were taught before. They changed it into the Rodul Murbi. And they forced it like kind of It's going towards a direction. Yeah, and the new so. movement of the mashayikh, some of them, is that they're doing tahlilat and yani, within the ara and the opinions of the... And this person is spending so much time within the madhab, scuffling inside the madhab, where he doesn't even get a chance to bring the riwayat and the hadith and the turuq and the, yani, how to reconcile the hadith. He's reconciling between yani, imen and their words and too much, too much. Yeah. So how do you respond to this claim that the madhab follows have we follow Ahmed, Malik, Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i and you follow Ibn Uthameen, Bin Baz, Albani and we, our scholars are greater than yours, they preceded yours? No, these sh- ulama like Shaykh Ibn Baz and Shaykh Ibn Uthameen and Shaykh Al-Albani rahimahullah ta'ala we need their fatawa because of nawazil al-mustajadat contemporary issues that happened mm. and he, we need to know their fatwas on it so that's not something we can dismiss but If they get it right, we take it. I mean, you see, the haq, if it's with Albani and it's not with Imam Shafi'i, we take it. And if the haq is with Shafi'i, we take it. The haq, where it is and whosoever hand it is in, we'll take it from them. It doesn't matter who has it. It could be a scholar in India, we'll take it from him. It could be a scholar in Africa, we'll take it from him. It could be a scholar in Europe, we'll take it from him. Hmm. Okay. Now. Uh, it's been a very long discussion. No. Um, just to summarize some of your thoughts, some of your final thoughts, summarize some of the stuff that we discussed today. I'm going to let you end the podcast with your thoughts, inshallah. Well, like what I said at the beginning, you know, the importance of following the Quran and the Sunnah and venerating the Quran and the Sunnah. That's وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُوذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنُهُ فَانْتَهُوا يعني فَلِي حَذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنَ أَمْرِي أَن تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةً أو يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Trials and tribulations come from opposing the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, Ubadat ibn Samit radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he spoke about the issue of two dirhams being given for one dirham dirhamini bi dirhamin he said this is riba and this was the time when Umar radiyallahu anhu sent Ubadat ibn Samit with Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and he went and then when Ubadat gave that fatwa based on the hadith of the Prophet Muawiyah said la ara bihi I don't see a problem in this issue Ubadat ibn Samit, he said, I am telling you that the Prophet said, and you're now saying to me, La Arabi Ba'asan? How is it? And La Arabi Ba'asan? Yet and be it. If as long as they give it to each other hand by hand, I don't see, I don't see it as a riba. And then what he said to him was, Wallahi, La yudhilluni anta wa ana. Wallahi, I swear by Allah, you and I are never going to share and we're not going to be shaded on the same roof. In other words, in some of the riwayat he mentioned, Wallahi, I'm never going to stay in a place where you govern. Wow. And Ma'awi was a governor. And he left him. And he came back to Medina. And Umar, Umar ibn Khattab said to uh, Ubadah, why are you here? And he said, I couldn't stay with Muawiyah. He, this is what I said to him. And he, Umar said a letter to Muawiyah and said, listen, you don't govern Ubadah. 
You don't control ibadah, you don't have nothing, no authority over ibadah. Number one. Number two, the fatwa he gave you is what everybody has to implement. You understand? Yeah. So uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said, La tamna'u ima Allahi masajid. He said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, La tamna'u ima Allahi masajid Allahi wa buyutuna khayru lahum. That the Prophet, he said, I heard from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, do not prevent the women from going to the masjids. Abdullah ibn Umar's son came Bilal and he said, uh, I will stop them from it. And then he said to him, La'anatullahi alayk, la'anatullahi alayk, la'anatullahi alayk, three times. It's not a light issue. Meaning in English? May Allah's curse be upon you. May Allah curse be upon you. May Allah's curse. Three times. Yani, may Allah's mercy be distanced from you. Three times to his own son. And he got up and he was so angry and he cried and he walked away. He said, I'm saying to you, the Prophet said, and then he, the narration mentions Ibn Umar died and he never spoke to his son. Allahu Akbar. And they took the issue of leaving hadith and dismissing the Prophet's madhab. Yani the Prophet's statements, they took it very serious. Somebody told you, Qala Rasulullah, and you said, well, wait. They saw this to be very, very evil. Because he came at the ayah, فَلْيَحْذَ لِلَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةً أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ كَلَامَتِي وَلِذَلِكَ وَاللَّهِ A land that the people of hadith who called the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ are missing from, that land لا خير فيه. There's no khair in it. A land where ara al rijal, the opinions of men and the views of people is just merely being spoken about. And qala Rasulullah is not mentioned and it's not talked and it's not brought to the table. There's not much khair that's going to come from it. So let's all go back to what the Prophet was and the way he was alayhi salatu salam. And all of these things that we're studying, let's all see it as a means. Mm. Let's not make it an, uh, the goal. Nah, yani, don't make the madhab the goal and the ultimate goal. And that's all. And you see a person all day madhab, he's studying it. And not one hadith does he know. And he'll tell you, Fulan said this, Alan said this, he's his opinion, riwayatan anhu, this is the mu'tamad in the madhab. And, he, akhi, and does not know one hadith. So we have another extreme of people who say, Shafi'i, hum rijal wa nahnu rijal, they're men. Yani where men The first part you got right They're men But the second part Allah Alam mm. No they're men <laughs> That's right Where men Allah Alam Does that make sense mm. So And those same people If you gave them a kitab And said read it akhi, And you know Read it from yourself Without no grammatical mistakes He can't read it mm. And they say Men where men Ahmed Zaman where men yani Abu Hanifa Zaman where men yani Kif so, Intending by that that they, we're the same, we have the right to do this. What they what do, they we did. can do. Yeah, yeah. And another extreme, خير الأمور أو سطوها, the best of affairs is the middle part. Hmm. So I conclude there, inshallah ta'ala. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me, shaytan, and Allah and His Messenger are both free from it. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdi, ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka wa tubilayh.